Like the thing is, is people don't appreciate that this is like, we're in a war. Diamond hand. Infinite means infinite. Infinite risk, infinite reward. I'm sure my portfolio looks a lot of red, but I'm in it for the long haul. Lambos or Wendy's, I'm gonna get my tendies. There are tens of thousands of hours of video and text in existence, all seeking to explain what exactly happened with GameStop in January 2021. There are explainer videos, unhinged rants, congressional hearings, and Netflix-produced documentaries, all trying to tell the story of this one weird moment in time and what it might mean, what it says about us, our society, and our economy. The common version is that a band of plucky retail investors put the screws to hedge fund Melvin Capital in a historic short squeeze, an unprecedented win for the little guy. The nuanced read is that it was a confluence of once-in-a-generation social forces, a short squeeze, but also a FOMO-fueled social media phenomenon where just as many regular folk got wrecked as made off like bandits. That, however, is merely where our story starts. This is a story about what happened next. This is a story about finance, social media, conspiracy theories, gambling, mortal men elevated to mythological figures, and a mountain of human suffering built of a thousand little lies. This is financial advice. relating to exchange practices have been characterized by greater differences of opinion than that of short selling. But what is a short sale? A short sale involves borrowing an asset, selling it at current market value, and then returning it later, ideally at a lower price than when it was sold. Put simply, it's selling borrowed goods to buy back at a profit. There are some things that we need to caveat right off the top here. First and foremost is that meme stock investors, or apes as they call themselves for reasons we'll get into later, aren't engaging with the reality as you or I understand it. You'll hear of references to things that you're aware of, companies that exist in your universe, but you and apes aren't talking about the same thing. Your version of GameStop is an unprofitable mall retailer that was headed slowly but inexorably towards bankruptcy due to societal shifts and regular old mismanagement that in 2021 got something resembling a second chance via once-in-a-generation circumstances. That second chance might pan out into some form of future relevance, or at least existence, maybe, but could just as easily be squandered and result in bankruptcy anyway. One way or another, the price as it currently stands is still floating well above GameStop's historical peak profitability during the heyday of the Wii, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360, so even a tremendous turnaround would still almost certainly see the stock price continue to decline. The ape version of GameStop is an apocalyptic catalyst, the chosen vessel through which the world will be reborn, a mythological entity built brick by brick out of communal desperation, delusion, and cope, obsessed with the financial concept of short selling and a short squeeze. Their version of reality is undoubtedly more interesting, more dramatic, and more sensational, but the reasons for its existence are complex. It is tempting to say that the participants are merely ignorant or incompetent, but the sticky truth is nuanced. There are many elements of ape lore that are pure performance, overt pieces of fiction that persist in the collective narrative simply because it would be nice for apes if they were true. The primary lens of ape culture, born as it was on Reddit, is that of video games. They have cast a variety of people, businesses, and institutions as their matched opponent, and will often post taunting letters addressed to Ken Griffin specifically, or hedge funds broadly, where they invoke their prowess in MMOs. Bro, I play RuneScape! I literally grind for days to watch a number go up one. 
Been playing 15 years and still not lost interest. <laughs> they think it's going to be any different now? I just realized how fucked shorts are. They picked a fight with the gaming industry, the same people who will grind hours on end losing thousands of times in a row to simply get one win. We refuse to end on a loss. We refuse to sell. I did one of the most degenerate grinds that exists for this picture only. This entire genre of post is profoundly sad, not merely because of the implication that a willingness to wander in circles for hours clicking on virtual plants is somehow a transferable skill to playing the stock market, but because they all presume a very high degree of symmetry and intentionality. They are based on the belief that, like in a video game, both sides are knowingly engaged in a match competition. But when you back up and evaluate the whole picture, their opponents aren't aware of the game at all, assuming that the ape is even talking about a group that actually exists. On their forums, they are winning epic battles against automated trading algorithms specifically tuned to drive GameStop out of business. They are in a war with the hedgies, who are always, every single day, getting desperate and running out of ammo. In reality, apes are shadowboxing the random noise of the market and losing. It has become a layer cake of every genre of magical thinking, new faith religiosity, reheated conspiracy theories, and general superstition, with an added extra thick frosting in the form of financial woo, get rich quick culture, sunk costs, and gambler's fallacy. A lot of their language is rooted in the culture of 4chan and Reddit. They call themselves apes, partly in reference to Planet of the Apes and Starship Troopers, but also because the other words they call themselves made them look bad when the media started to pay attention. It is a hazily defined movement dispersed across all of social media and dozens of forums, burdened with two years of petty drama, infighting, and fragmentation. Due to their extreme beliefs, their culture has grown more and more insular over time, so their communication is predictably littered with in-jokes, niche references, shibboleths, abbreviations, jargon, and private definitions of words borrowed from other disciplines, which can make it understandably difficult to follow along. We can get there. I believe in us. We can make this make sense. But boy howdy does the journey require a journey. The version of the story that you're already familiar with is one where a bunch of Redditors tried to short-squeeze some hedge funds and get rich in the process by buying GameStop. Meanwhile, the quote-unquote meme stocks turned over. These companies, pumped up by amateur traders on social platforms like Reddit, with the expressed purpose of forcing certain hedge funds to lose money, well, they plummeted today. The version of the story you're not familiar with is the one where two years after the squeeze, heat lamp theory penned by Reddit user Six Days One Week argues that financial service provider computer shares operational algorithm is being tricked by short hedge funds into storing plan held shares in the DTCC like burgers under a heat lamp, and also probably someone made it illegal to report these heat lamp shares as directly registered, thus suppressing the evidence that apes own the float. Although that post was low effort, and the speculation itself turned out not to be completely correct, my hunch was still valid. It was often attacked by what I believe were bad actors asking me to prove someone made it illegal. The abuse of computer shares algorithm was obvious to apes who were paying attention. Ever since Ryan Cohen's I want to be the book king tweet, it was clear that Cohen was signaling for apes to terminate their plans, sell their fractionals, and book their shares. What was not obvious was the reaction of the mods who would attempt to bury the story, revealing themselves to be paid shills clearly compromised by the hedgies in order to distract from Heatlamp. Censorship of Heatlamp DD shows we are heading in the right direction. What the fuck is this shit? So, we still get pushback for Heatlamp at other places, but someone can post a sponsored DD that is literally the definition of FUD and says in that comment that DRS is pointless and MOS will not happen. The Heatlamp Theory DD to me is as impressive as the House of Cards DD. It's like the DDs from the beginning of Super Stonk. So, yeah, there's a lot of ground to cover before that makes any sense at all. Everywhere you look, the impact can be felt. 
The modern corporation consists of many moving parts, from manufacturing to distribution to communications. Likewise, the finances behind the corporation are equally complex, a delicately balanced dance of equity and credit that facilitates the many wonders of the modern world. One of the most misunderstood and contentious mechanisms of this dance is what is called a short sale. Few subjects relating to exchange practices have been characterized by greater differences of opinion than that of short selling. Though many characterize shorting as a toxic modern practice, in reality, it is quite old, and it has polarized people for as long as it's existed. But what is a short sale? A short sale involves borrowing an asset, selling it at current market value, and then returning it later, ideally at a lower price than when it was sold. Put simply, it's selling borrowed goods to buy back at a profit. Two things happen with this arrangement. First is that the short seller gets to hold the full sale value for a period of time until the asset is returned, providing them with capital that they can use in the interim. Second is that when the asset is returned, this represents not the moment where the short seller makes money, but merely when they lock in their final profits. The risk-reward proposition of short selling is that gains are capped by the price at the time of borrowing. If an asset is borrowed at $5, then the absolute maximum profit is $5, discounting fees and interest, of course. On the flip side is the risk profile. The maximum losses of a short sale are effectively infinite, as the price of the asset isn't bounded to 100% or even 10,000% of the original sale price. As the trend for the economy as a whole is to grow, a stock going from $5 to $10 is far more common than stocks going from $5 to zero. In addition, the borrower is expected to pay the original owner a recurring fee based on the value of the asset, similar to interest paid on a loan, called the cost to borrow, or CTB. However, unlike a personal loan that you might already be familiar with, such as a mortgage, where the payment encompassed both interest and principal on a schedule where the whole loan is eventually paid off, the cost to borrow is paid every month, prorated by day, with no cap. Thus, borrowing an asset for long periods of time can quickly eat up profit margins or even exceed the original value of the asset itself. For these reasons, it is uncommon to hold a short position for long periods of time. Even though the name short selling comes from the bet that the asset will decline or fall short, it is coincidentally appropriate that short plays tend toward short time frames of weeks or months rather than months or years. However, this short time frame leaves the borrower more exposed to short-term volatility. Disruptions that might temporarily set a company back without impacting the overall health of the business can benefit short sellers greatly, while unexpected good news can generate a surge of excitement about a company that may leave short sellers hurting, and lenders pressuring them to return the asset or incur further liability. At the most extreme, lenders can compel the borrower to return the asset in full, regardless of the cost to the borrower. When short sellers are impelled to return large volumes of shares all at once, this sudden buying pressure can further potentiate upwards movement on the price of the security, applying further margin pressures to other existing short positions. This situation is commonly referred to as a short squeeze, as the short sellers are squeezed out of their positions by the accelerating costs. I mean, they can try. They can try as hard as they want to try to demoralize us. But uh, like, as I always say, no sell, no sell. I'm not selling. Power to the players. Power to the shareholders. Power to the individual investors, each choosing for themselves to a, a, a company that they believe in. In late January 2021, video game retailer GameStop became a media sensation as the value of their stock rose from $20 to just shy of $500 over the course of four days. The exact confluence of events that led to this have been thoroughly documented, so we won't drag the point out here, but the critical takeaway is this. It was a once-in-a-lifetime event that hinged off multiple specific coincidences. One, the pandemic made the situation for brick-and-mortar retail dire due to multivalent impacts, so many hedge funds had taken out short positions against them, anticipating a continued decline in revenue and thus share price. Two, governments began to distribute stimulus packages in an attempt at offsetting the economic impact of the pandemic. Three, there was a zeitgeist of futility in the air that financially the average person was screwed. The stimulus package wasn't enough to fix anything, so you might as well blow it on something reckless. 
In specific, hedge fund Melvin Capital holds a truly reckless short position in GameStop that left the fund extremely exposed if the price were to rise, and traders on Reddit see this as an opportunity and begin promoting it on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. As the idea of getting in on a potential GameStop short squeeze spreads through social media in late 2020, the messaging gets flattened. New people are flooding into Reddit's Wall Street Bets forum, they are bringing with them their own ideas, their own politics, their own expectations. The thing that really speaks to people and thus works well for recruiting is the idea that this is a chance to hurt Wall Street. As more and more people pile in, the experienced traders get tired of explaining things over and over. Thus, new people are being onboarded by people who themselves have a stock trading career best measured in hours. These are users who jumped onto forums and explicitly asked, how do I get in on GameStop as fast as possible? They're not getting a lecture on risk management, market operations, and exit strategy. Not that Wall Street bets would ever be a good place to get those. They're getting a hype speech about revenge for 2008 and a bare bones series of instructions on what buttons to push. Potentiating that, any large leaderless movement with foggy politics is going to attract a whole slew of political opportunists from all across the spectrum who hope to steer the tsunami in their preferred direction. These people, trying to transform it into a coherent political movement, inject and amplify a lot of narrative about solidarity and making a difference. Ape together strong. That's the kerosene that primes this whole thing to turn into an apocalyptic investment cult. This is a bold claim and it's basically unfalsifiable, but I feel like I can point to the match, the event that really, truly allowed for conspiratorial thought to take permanent root in ape culture, and that's January 28th, 2021, mid-morning when Robinhood, an app-based free brokerage, disabled the buying of GME and a selection of other meme stocks. Just this morning, Robinhood, which is really seen as the brokerage firm of choice for a lot of those younger investors, said that in light of recent volatility, they're restricting transactions for certain securities to position close only. And to be clear, that means you can sell names like GameStop, but you can't buy them. That was the day the price hit its all-time high. And in ape mythology, that was when they were on the cusp of, like, total revolution. The entire system was about to collapse and apes were about to be crowned victors over Wall Street. Robinhood turning off the buy button was, from their point of view, an obvious sign of targeted disruption. The reality is far more mundane. Robinhood runs a disruptive brokerage with a very tech bro, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission philosophy. In a nutshell, the idea is that they run all their accounts by default as a kind of limited margin account that they call instant deposits. You make an account, start to transfer money to your account, the money hasn't technically arrived yet, but Robinhood lets you act like it has. You want to buy a stock, Robinhood pays for it up front, and then just takes your money when it finally arrives. This undeniably speeds things up and makes them appealing to, say, a huge swath of people who want to get in on this opportunity to make life-changing money right now before it's too late, but exposes Robinhood to pretty substantial risk. If a million new users all sign up on the same day and all immediately try and buy GameStop at $300 a share via instant deposits, Robinhood might risk running out of money. So the mundane reality is that the influx of new users all making pretty aggressive plays in a specific basket of stocks stressed Robinhood's credit and threatened its collateral across the board, so they shut down buying of those specific securities to protect themselves. In the aftermath, the CEO of Robinhood, Vlad Tenev, denied that the company had, in fact, basically run out of money, which may or may not have been true, but did confirm the fundamentals of the threat. So we're really in unprecedented times. And in order to protect the firm and protect our customers, um, we had to limit buying in these in these stocks. And to be absolutely clear, it again, it this sounds wasn't... To... Go ahead. But, but it, it sounds to me, though, that you're suggesting that there was a liquidity problem. Turns out giving everyone a margin account is a good idea until it isn't. But that's boring. You know what's exciting? 
They turned off the buy button specifically to kill the squeeze. They want you to sell. That's an exciting idea. The funny thing is that it didn't even kill the pump. Sure, Robinhood and a few other app-based brokers with a similar structure halted buying, but cash account brokers were trading just fine, and GME still rallied pretty hard the next day, peaking back over $400. The buy button was maybe a wake-up call, a sign that the music was probably about to stop and you should cash out while you can, but what actually killed the momentum was the weekend. When the smoke clears, there's a congressional hearing, there's an SEC report, there's actually a ton of scrutiny in and around the specific events. Melvin Capital eats some truly staggering losses and needs to turn to Citadel Securities for a bailout to avoid closing entirely. Regulators are worried about how well they're communicating with retail investors. Legislators are worried social media influencers aren't accountable enough. Everyone knows that a charismatic figure can fleece individuals and pump and dump a single stock, but do the events of January suggest that influencers can pose a systemic risk to the market itself? Who, if anyone, was responsible for January? Thing is that while a bunch of people made a ton of money off GameStop in January, that money has to come from somewhere. In an actual short squeeze, the idea is that the money comes from the short sellers. They're the ones buying vastly overpriced GameStop shares. So, if this was a squeeze, that's simple. But, you know, was it actually a squeeze? The SEC report didn't come out until fall 2021, and while still pretty dry and technical, it does try to engage with the general public who know a bit about the stock market but aren't deep in the weeds. It's not flawless, but the conclusions are sound. GameStop was a complicated mix of activities that fed off one another. There was a short squeeze in the mix, a bunch of the traffic that saw GameStop starting to pump at the beginning of the week was driven by known short sellers closing their positions, but the main body of it all, the buyers who pushed the price up to just shy of $500, that was overwhelmingly retail buyers. The people left holding the bag when the music stopped wasn't Melvin Capital, wasn't Citadel, wasn't BlackRock, it was apes. And a lot of those apes were new recruits whose first day of stock trading in their lives was from installing Robinhood and buying GME that week. The story of apes post-squeeze is a bunch of people standing around a trashed hotel room at 5 a.m. asking when the party is supposed to start, a bunch of newly minted bag holders trying to manifest another, even larger squeeze because the only way they could possibly make money off of their $420 GME shares is if it somehow goes even higher. Everything becomes fodder for theories about what really happened and why the price didn't just keep going up. Direct share registration, naked shorts, reg show, none of this mattered to apes at all in January, but suddenly in February and March, these ideas get injected as explanations for why the squeeze didn't keep squeezing. They will, in the months that follow, recast January as the sneeze, both to suggest that not only was it not the main event, it was a tiny blip compared to the inevitable true squeeze, the mother of all short squeezes. Moass. I'd like to welcome you all to the Bellagio Resort and Casino in scenic Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, enjoying... Uh, enjoying some early tendies. Uh, there's there's some news on the wind that, uh, that that big things are coming. Big things are coming as early as this weekend, and uh, and Bobby's pumping. I don't think anything could really go wrong. I think uh, I think there's a lot of people out there who want to make it look like things are going wrong. I hold for the infinity pool. Just I buy, I hold, I DRS. Moass is a tricky thing to talk about. First of all, it is a pure financial conspiracy theory. We're used to conspiracy theories that intersect with finance. Most get around to the subject of international bankers eventually. But those theories tend to start in sociology, science, or politics, and then expand to cover finance as they grow. MOAS starts in finance with the operations of the stock market. So just from the word go, the subject is already inundated with unfamiliar terminology, organizations, and acronyms. 
This is all compounded by the fact that the exact composition of the belief is mercurial. MOAS is a vessel conspiracy containing many other modular theories. These theories are disparate, obtuse, self-referential, and often contradictory if not outright paradoxical. It is, as a whole, a theory that resists critical thought at every turn. If you try to formulate an all-encompassing version of it, you will find only frustration. The jar, MOAS itself, is the belief that for some reason or another, GameStop or some other meme stock company is going to skyrocket in value and make everyone who times it right unfathomably rich in the blink of an eye. Everything inside the jar is the how and the why. Taken as a whole, MOAS is many things. It's an apocalyptic event, it's an infinite money glitch, it's revenge against Wall Street, it's salvation for those who gambled away their life savings, but above all, MOAS is a story. And that story goes a little something like this. What you need to know before the MOAS, during the MOAS, and after the MOAS all in one video. Well, let's start by chugging this bitch and get going. We know we own the float. So if they have to cover, that means they have to pay the price that we say. Now, if we hold to 10 million, that's what they have to pay. So if it goes to 100,000, if it goes to 250,000, if it goes to 1,000, if it goes to 500, that ain't the squeeze, baby. That ain't the squeeze. What's the squeeze is once it's past 10 million, then we're squeezing. Some point in the near future, in my opinion, we have the MOAS actually happening. Where we've survived all the fight, we survived the short attacks, and then the MOAS happens, baby. And then we pass our floor of 10 million or 20 million, and we get up to a ceiling of let's say 420 million dollars a share. And if you're raising your eyebrows, hey, that's not possible. The whole economy will be ruined. Shut up! You don't know what you're talking about. Do your research. 500 million per share is not a meme. I am dead serious. Major financial firms, most notably hedge funds such as Ken Griffin Citadel, owe their profits to massive volumes of fraudulent, naked short sales, flooding the market with phantom shares that suppress the price of companies like GameStop, AMC Theaters, and Bed Bath & Beyond. This scheme has generated unfathomable amounts of debt that hedgies could never afford to pay back, hundreds of billions of shares owed that don't actually exist and thus cannot be returned, adding up to trillions of dollars of debt, so their only hope is if the victim company goes out of business entirely, allowing the hedgies to walk away with tax-free gains. The risk is so extreme that it justifies every employee at hundreds of financial institutions, the media, the government, and the courts all cooperating to keep the conspiracy under wraps. But if that scheme were to be revealed, if Citadel were forced to buy back those hundreds of billions of shares, it would trigger a short squeeze that would send GameStop's share value into phone number prices and create a cascade that could topple the entire global economy. Because there are so many fake shares, apes have already bought more shares than are supposed to exist. They own the float and have thus positioned themselves to be the beneficiaries of that apocalyptic unraveling as long as they can remain united and refuse to sell their shares. If no one sells, then the supply is zero and the price is infinite. Then apes can dictate not only the price, but they can make demands. If Ken Griffin isn't sent to prison for his purported crimes, the deal is off. No sell, no sell. As the evidence of the fraud ripples through the economy, as the entire stock market is revealed to be a sham, faith in institutions will falter, and in an existential crisis, the government will be forced to make apes whole or else face their own extinction, precipitating the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. And then, when the flames of Moas have cleansed the earth, it will usher in a golden age of humanity, stewarded by the true, diamond-handed apes who did not flinch in the face of paltry thousand percent gains did not become paper-handed bitches over mere wife-changing money, but hodled, hodled in the face of fear, hodled in the face of uncertainty, hodled in the face of doubt. So what happens in theory when they can't get enough shares, even with the price in the millions? The price goes to the tens of millions, then hundreds of millions, billions if it has to. Price is just supply and demand. All I have to do is buy one stock Buy one stock, GameStop, feel good about it, and watch the world crumble. 
A thing that's kind of beautiful about a short squeeze is that you don't really need to do anything. You just need to be in the right place at the right time. And a thing that marbles through the whole subject of meme stocks is a sublime laziness. This is a characteristic of all get-rich-quick schemes, but it's important to keep in mind as apes build this complex theory, as they fill the jar, and as they become increasingly irate when Moas fails to materialize, that all they've done, all they've actually done, is press a buy button. As Morant said, all he has to do is buy one stock, feel good about it, and watch the world crumble. It's just Reddit's version of the rapture. Now, in these sample narratives of Moas, we've already made a mistake, which is trying to pin down the specifics in some coherent way. A critical element of talking about Moas is that the component beliefs are modular. The jar, the part where apes get rich, is the only constant. Any specific belief can be readily discarded or swapped without posing a risk to the integrity of the structure as a whole. For example, many MOAS theories cite the idea that Citadel wouldn't need to pay taxes on any gains from short positions if the victim company goes completely out of business. This makes narrative sense, but just isn't true. Like, there, there's not much else that needs to be done to debunk that, it's just false. But removing it from the jar doesn't really do anything, and it also doesn't matter if you debunk it, because apes will just put it back in anyway. As a result, the meme stock belief system has become an absolute rat's nest of false threads, misinformation, willful ignorance, and reheated conspiracy theories from the 90s, all of which has been constantly adjusted to compensate for the fact that reality keeps disproving it. It's a mess. So how does a philosophy like MOAS develop? That is actually a shockingly long explanation. A major problem here, as I said, is that a lot of this is contradictory and circular. A pile of half-baked theories cooked up piecemeal by apes with no understanding of the underlying subject, working specifically to find a thing that would need to be true in order to maintain the conspiracy cascade. The only reason they believe there are hundreds of billions of fake GameStop shares in circulation is because that's the thing that needs to be true in order to explain why they believe shorts never closed in 2021, and they believe shorts never closed in 2021, because it's the thing that needs to be true in order for the squeeze to still be on the table, and the squeeze needs to still be on the table, because otherwise, what are you doing? Why are you here? But also a lot of these specific ideas, they got them from somewhere, and investigating that somewhere just opens up a rabbit hole where you spend months delving into other pre-existing conspiracy theories that have tried to graft themselves onto the meme stock movement. February 2021, following the price of GameStop crashing back to Earth, many apes who bought in late or held through it were extremely salty and needed something or someone to blame that wasn't just, you know, making a poor financial decision based on Reddit hype posts. The fiasco with Robinhood turning off the buy button initially floated to the top because there are, even in our reality, some questions about how that was handled and Robinhood's business model that are very much worth asking. Apes, of course, care about none of that. All the talk about market reform is just smoke. They're here to crash the system and get rich. So what they see in the Robinhood fiasco is targeted disruption. Someone pulled strings to turn off the buy button and stop the squeeze, which means someone's scared. The whole thing must still be primed to pop off again. Apes declare that shorts never closed, the squeeze never ended. It's just in a bit of a gully, and it's going to shoot back up any day now if they can get the pressure back up. The second thing they latch on to is that Citadel bailed out Melvin. Now, in reality, this wasn't a philanthropic gesture, it was a lot closer to a protection racket shakedown because Wall Street are all greedy assholes. And Melvin folded under the pressure in 2022 anyway, but it gives apes a villain, Ken Griffin. Apes assert that he must have personally called Vlad Tenev at Robin Hood and told him to turn off the buy button in order to protect Citadel and then lied to Congress when he told them under oath that he didn't do that. This seed narrative proves just sticky enough to keep people emotionally invested, and from there, apes crowdsource the explanations, tacking on more and more oblique ideas lifted out of the complexity and obfuscation of capital markets in order to explain why this thing is still primed to pop. 
Part of what makes MOAS persuasive, why people buy in, is that very complexity and obfuscation. People come into the subject with well-founded skepticism of Wall Street. The narrative that Wall Street is corrupt, reckless, and greedy is persuasive in no small part because it isn't wrong. So meme stock proselytes present themselves as the ones who are cutting through the darkness, exposing the deliberately obfuscated truth of how the market really works, democratizing the ivory tower of finance. Now, despite its reputation, finance as a subject is in fact something that you, a layperson, can learn. It is a lot less impenetrable than it seems. Wall Street is awash with B- students who wrapped their heads around it, you can too. But we need to be careful here because just because the subject is more accessible than you might think, that doesn't mean it's devoid of actual honest-to-God complexity and nuance. Understanding how to evaluate a mutual fund or trying your hand at making money day trading is not that complex. Understanding loopholes in securities regulation is. So in the theory of MOAS, we have a collision of the rhetoric of the democratization of finance with the actual impenetrable stuff that even the majority of the people on Wall Street don't bother to understand. And the systems of the economy are so intertwined and obtuse that it's possible to sculpt almost any story one can imagine through the framing. It is a perfect recipe for someone to very confidently present you with extremely wrong information that you have no reference point to evaluate from. And if it wasn't already clear, MOAS is almost totally devoid of any actual economics. Like, think about it. Their theory is that Wall Street is so reckless and greedy that they have created this powder keg that will allow apes to make unfathomable amounts of money off of MOAS. But despite this powder keg sitting in the open where Redditors could stumble into it, no one on Wall Street is greedy or reckless enough to pursue it, despite having substantially greater resources at their disposal to do so. And the conspiracy apes claim to be unraveling is both incredibly vast and yet leaves no material evidence. No memos, no emails, no insiders, just ghosts in the trading data. But also, apes will readily discard the data if it tells the wrong story. They'll just claim the price is fake, the stock is manipulated, bad news is deliberate misinformation, you can only trust the numbers when the line goes up. Since you can't trust news, data, or even company filings, the only thing to do is buy at any price and hold for MOAS. The mother of all short squeezes is a lot of things, but it's not a trading strategy. But please, if you think this is at all unfair to the ape thesis, feel free to do your own research. Peruse the Super Stonk Flipbook page with over 200 Reddit posts dressed up to look like books. Enjoy such critically acclaimed works as The Billionaire Boys Club by Badass Trader, Trust, Death, and Divorce, the parts of Ken Griffin's life that haven't been published, and Infinity War, the final exit DD compilation by Gherkinet. Regardless of the lack of actual finance underpinning it, we do need to establish some basic literacy in order to explain why it all falls apart and to contextualize what's so fascinating about the community that has grown up around it. So real quick, what is a stock anyway? Stocks or shares aren't a real thing. They're an intangible legal claim to some portion of a company or venture. They exist entirely in the realm of the social contract, and in some form or another are as old as civilization. Somewhere in ancient history, a couple people got together and were like, hey, let's pool our resources, dig a mine, and then split the proceeds. And in that moment, the share was born. Then, the second dude was like, hey, I don't really want to run a mine anymore. I'm trading my share of the mine for a goat farm. And now you have invented an equity market. Today's equity markets are a vastly more complex version of that. And the whole thing is in a constant state of flux, but the core concept is still there. A stock is an intangible bundle of legal rights that you can sell. But you're probably thinking to yourself, what about stock certificates? Hundreds of years ago, if you wanted to sell your shares in a mine, you'd need to go to the company offices where they keep the ledger of all the people that own a share in the mine, tell them, I'm selling my share to this guy here, take me off the list, and put his name instead. Upsides. The company knows exactly who owns what portion of the company. 
Downsides? Huge pain in the ass. To address the fact that this was a pain in the ass, some companies decided to embody the intangible rights into a tangible object. A certificate, a piece of paper imbued with legal magic that says possession of the paper is identical to possession of the legal rights, so that people who wanted to sell their share or even just a portion of their share could do so by handing over the certificates. But that's not a perfect system. You've probably already thought of some flaws, and once the telephone was invented, it became its own pain in the ass. What do you mean I need to actually move a box full of magic paper from Brooklyn to Manhattan? What a waste of time. Glossing over 100 years of securities regulations following the invention of the telephone and then the computer, the model that we currently use is what's called securities entitlements and beneficial ownership. When you buy shares via Robinhood, your shares are kept in a central depository, the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, or DTCC, with Robinhood's name on them, and then Robinhood keeps their own list of which of their clients owns what, forming a chain of beneficial ownership. Now, the DTCC, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, these are not government entities. They're private corporations that are overseen by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, which is part of the government. They are designed as self-regulating organizations. That's a phrase that throws up some red flags, but it is a term with a specific meaning. Designating an organization as self-regulating gives them some slack to do their neoliberal profit motive routine, subject to the approval and oversight of the regulator. If they want a new toy, they can have it, but we aren't paying for it. None of this means that self-regulating orgs or the SEC get automatic or unwavering faith, but it means you can't just claim self-regulated is synonymous with unregulated to explain why this vast conspiracy has invisibly rampaged completely unchecked. The actual stock market and its mechanics suck in the worst possible way the usual way. They carry literal centuries of bad habits, cut corners, and self-interest. We didn't end up with high security bank vaults full of jumbo-sized magic paper because it was the best system. The central depository model of clearing and settlement has a lot of genuine flaws, the kind of stuff that fuels beef between experts in the uniform commercial code. Perhaps Professor Coogan's criticism of the amendments may really be due to the fact that they transfer the provisions on creation and perfection of security interests in uncertificated securities from Article 9 to Article 8. Practitioners under Article 9 have been known to harbor a jealous regard for that area of practice which has traditionally been their own. Savage. All this is to say that criticisms of this system are very easy to find, but it's also very easy to misunderstand what you're looking at. The primary lens that apes view this complex market through is, of course, the short sale. Because it is the one thing they know about the stock market, it is the only thing that matters. It is made compelling by the fact that short selling is controversial well outside ape circles and has been for a very long time. It's been called blatant thuggery by U.S. Congressman Dennis Hastert. The Malaysian finance ministry wanted to cane short sellers, but light, similar to the punishment carried out on juveniles. During World War I, the New York Stock Exchange imposed short-selling regulations in part out of fear that German spies would utilize short sales to harm the economy. But for apes, who were introduced to the concept by the big short, it's a personal insult. Short everything that guy has touched. I want half a billion more swaps. And all the while, short sales have the unique quirk of putting downward pressure on the stock price by increasing supply. So short sales do contain a self-fulfilling component. Now, there's a Nobel Prize in economics waiting for you if you can quantify that self-fulfilling element, but for apes, the theory alone is enough to overwhelm all other considerations. For them, it goes to the furthest possible extreme. Short sales can kill a profitable company stone dead. When taken in combination, short selling becomes a literal conspiracy. The act itself becomes financial terrorism. Quite literally, Whatever retail buys, they short. If an institution's holding it, it's not gonna get shorted. Why do you think Amazon became the most overpowered merchant there is? I work for the company and I can tell you. It's because retail wasn't holding it. 
so then their ticker can go up because institutions were holding it. One of the truly revolutionary moments in the development of MOAS as a theory came when apes dredged up a conspiracy theory favored by dot-com companies who were convinced that they were being targeted for destruction by naked short sellers. Naked short sales are kind of tricky to talk about because the well of discussion is so poisoned by these conspiracy theorists. A naked short sale is when you generate a short sale without actually borrowing a share first. It is a real thing, it is illegal and has been for a while, people have gone to jail for doing it, it was a historical problem, but not for the reasons apes and their ilk claim. The problem is compounded by the fact that a number of legitimate market mechanics resemble naked short selling if you squint. So there's the real thing off over in the corner that people go to jail for doing because like, there's evidence of their crimes. And then there's a fantasy version espoused by cranks where shadowy figures destroy companies for profit without leaving any evidence. The infuriating thing is that it really kind of doesn't even matter because most apes don't bother to distinguish between regular short sales and naked short sales. Apes start from short sellers are the bad guys and rail against anything that enables short selling, like stock lending, which is obviously important to short selling because you can't borrow a share unless someone's lending them. Apes only rope in a crank version of naked shorts when they eventually need to explain why there's no evidence of the short position that would need to exist in order for the short squeeze to still be on the table. So let's walk through it. In mid-March of 2021, a Reddit post on Wall Street Bets received 22,000 upvotes arguing that the squeeze hadn't truly ended. Anybody with a brain knows that GME is not fundamentally worth its current price of this post at $215 per share. The main talking point across all the investing subreddits and news outlets was the fact that GME's short percentage reached a height of 140%. But what does a 140% float mean? Did the hedge fund short slash borrow more shares than even existed? Well, yes, that's called naked shorting, but it's more complicated than that. By the standards of present-day theories, this is rather quaint. The Redditor mistakenly believed that the short sellers had survived the squeeze by purchasing shares created by market makers whose job is to trade to customers regardless of whether they own the asset at the time, mandating something resembling naked short selling at times. To the author, the excessive short interest was clear evidence of a naked short position of at least 40% of the entire share count. That isn't sound. In fact, it misunderstands basic mechanics of how a short sale even works. In this instance, we've exceeded 100% short interest because buyers are blind to the intent of the seller. No new shares have been created. A single share can be bought, lent, and sold as many times in a row as there are parties willing to engage in the trade. Mere days later, an article would be discovered from the blog oilprice.com, your number one source for your oil and energy news. The article reframed the GameStop incident not as a short squeeze nor as a retail frenzy, but as a skirmish between retail investors and manipulative, illegal, naked short selling. GameStop was the victim of a malicious short attack, the exact same thing that is happening to the Canadian mining sector. This article would validate the ape's anxieties. The buy button wasn't some isolated incident predicated on boring details about credit and margin. This was systemic. Wall Street has been doing stuff like this to companies since the dot-com bubble. The squeeze needed to be killed because apes were onto something. As a conspiracy theory, these narratives of naked short attacks endure because they're convenient, impossible to disprove, but there's also just enough truth to it that it can't be debunked like your typical conspiracy theory. To this end, apes become very concerned about ideas of fake ownership and fake shares, two separate ideas with their own implications. You need to have real ownership of real shares. As demonstrated earlier, the subject of what owning a stock even is, is kinda a weird mess built on centuries of jank, which makes it really easy for apes to simply describe it as fake ownership. Beneficial ownership via a broker is just an IOU, and they're probably lending your shares out to short sellers, which means financial terrorism. The term fake share refers to numerous different ideas and they can be used interchangeably. The specifics are irrelevant. 
It could be the dilutive effects of naked shorts, mislabeled orders, rehypothecation, the obligation warehouse, the ghost of the stock borrow program, or persistent failures to deliver. Doesn't matter. They've churned through a dozen different theories for where fake shares might be coming from and might be hiding. For apes, trading is like a video game, and they're all collectively hammering away to find an exploit to steal Ken Griffin's fat loot. The actual end boss that apes are at war with is reality. GameStop at this point in March is still massively overvalued, and the participants in the January 2021 frenzy are either cashing out some sweet gains or cutting their losses. The apes who are in really deep are convinced that it's going to shoot back up any day now, but it doesn't. It's volatile, it swings a lot on any given day, but the ultimate trend is down, and the explanation they come up with is that clearly this is because of short attacks. Normally, short attacks are specific, identifiable transactions made with the intent of spooking investors and triggering a wider sell-off. To apes, they are persistent, invisible, and need to be occurring in such high quantities as to defy all reason. Therefore, they must be occurring via naked shorts, and the attackers are avoiding closing the position… somehow. So logically, if the only reason the price is going down is because of these short attacks, then that must mean that GameStop is accruing more and more short interest with each one. The actual short interest in GameStop peaked at 140%, which is an astoundingly reckless situation and is the reason Melvin ate dirt, but once the apes ran the numbers themselves, they valued the true short interest at over 9,000%. And that number is pretty old at this point. Within a year, history would be rewritten, and it would be claimed that the catalyst for the GME squeeze wasn't FOMO or memes, it was the discovery of fake shares. So the idea is that there are a handful of real shares lost in the slurry of fake shares. Apes need to get their hands on these real shares, and how they go about this is very funny. As an example, there is a theory that stock options require the broker to deliver a real share, so some apes try to exercise out-of-the-money options. They want to buy shares for more than their current market value, deliberately losing money. That kind of behavior is indicative of an investor who has either made a mistake, is trying to manipulate the stock price, or is just incredibly stupid. Possibly all three, so intermediaries won't let you do it. When their request is refused, apes go nuclear at the customer support reps, making sovereign citizen-esque arguments as to why it's criminal for them to infringe on the investor's God-given right to lose money on purpose. But above all else, true ownership demands the use of the direct registration system. DRS allows the investor's ownership of a security to be recorded in their own name on the books of the issuing company's transfer agent. It exists to make this circuitous mess more palatable by giving investors an alternative, and it has a few legitimate functions. There's nothing wrong with DRS as a concept, but apes, again, distort it to the point of being barely recognizable. Apes gravitate towards it initially as a catalyst for MOAS, a way that they can force the hypothetical 9,000% short interest to close, and as a belief that there's so many fake shares in circulation that direct registration is the only way they'll be able to prove they have real shares during MOAS. But it very quickly evolves into a loyalty ritual. And you know it's always tomorrow until it's today, so I guess I'm just hot to let it till I get paid and I rest. The central depository model was built to specifically enable transactions to occur quickly. It was built to be brutally efficient above all else. DRS, by design, reintroduces inefficiency in transferring ownership. It makes selling your shares more expensive, and it's slow. Many transfer agents require you to send important requests by mail. Like with an envelope. That makes it a kind of symbolic castration. You're proving your conviction to the cause by hindering your ability to sell. It's community policy to keep your entire stake in DRS. If you keep some portion of it with your broker, it means you're enabling them to lend your shares to short sellers and commit financial terrorism. And the only reason you would keep the shares with your broker is if you were planning to sell. You aren't thinking of selling, right? 
Having opted into DRS, the shareholder receives mail from the transfer agent as evidence of their ownership. These letters are regularly paraded on the subreddits, posed alongside other sacred objects demonstrating loyalty to the company. God, a lot of these have firearms. Somewhere within this process, the ape ascends to the status of a bona fide shareholder. They hold real shares, entirely locked out of the reach of Wall Street. So I want you to visualize this. You're hooked on watching the price of GameStop every day. Whenever the price goes down, which it does often, it's because Ken Griffin, who orchestrated to kill the squeeze, is illegally naked shorting GME in order to suppress the price. So every week GME continues to accumulate more and more short interest. That means that every day the theoretical payout of MOAS gets larger and larger. In fact, the plausibility of Citadel ever willingly closing, ever slowly winding down their position, grows more and more impossible. MOAS becomes inevitable. Once the conspiracy is unveiled, something like 99% of GameStop shares will be revealed to be fake at the same time it's revealed that Citadel needs to buy back 90 times GameStop's value worth of GME. The short sellers now need to buy back real shares, which are exclusively held by apes. This alone would be absurd, but it gets worse. Under the infinity pool theory, apes will simply refuse to sell their shares. The supply will literally be zero, so the ticker might as well read infinity. It's just supply and demand. The plan is to never let the short sellers cover their position and hold them hostage in a basement and drip feed them one share at a time, with each ape making wife changing money with each sale. The purported values are childish and totally arbitrary, ranging from 10 to 500 million dollars per share as we've seen. The limiter on this is naturally, you know, reality. Citadel can't pay infinity dollars per share, nor can they pay 10 million a share. But don't worry, apes have already mapped out how the dominoes will fall. What if the unthinkable happens and more than 60% decide to hold GME to at least seven figures? DTC can only cover 66 the seven trillion what happens then then it goes to then it goes to the fed raj the fed has to turn on the printer so citadel will be vaporized the instant the news breaks and their obligations will flow to the central depository itself a central depository has never defaulted before we don't know for certain what will happen but apes have done their research and all agree that in the event the DTCC goes bust, the first priority for compensation will be bona fide shareholders to the detriment of all others. Like that 67 trillion figure suggests that the DTCC will liquidate your dad's investment portfolio to buy shares in GameStop. Once the depository defaults, we get something resembling global financial collapse, but the US government still has an obligation to compensate the Redditors for their losses. In the pure version of MOAS, apes take up the mantle of god kings of a whole new economy. Their new market would be blockchain-based, trading stock as NFTs, forcing short sellers to track down and return specific, identifiable shares because apes have a collective fantasy about being personally contacted by short sellers begging them to sell. MOAS realists argue instead that the US government, faced with this existential crisis, will simply cut a deal with the apes, and whether apes ought to squeeze the White House is a point of contention within the movement. So to sum up, MOAS is an infinite money glitch built on the idea that Wall Street as a whole conspires to smother dying companies through naked short sales. They do this through exploiting flaws in securities ownership and stock lending to produce fake shares. GameStop avoided its execution because Redditors intervened via a coincidence of destiny, and that positions GameStop as a catalyst to unravel the greatest fraud in history, with a side effect being that the US government will hand the keys to Fort Knox to a bunch of Redditors as a down payment for their shares in video game retailer GameStop. So that's the play. All the apes need to do now is find evidence of some fake shares. How hard can that be? Yeah, I'm picking up more GameStop. I'm picking up more Bed Bath & Beyond. I'm, I'm super excited for Bed Bath & Beyond. I'm seeing a lot of bullish sentiment online, a lot of really good peer-reviewed theories, some DD, you know, Cohen's still in this play, Icon's in this play. We're gonna see some collaboration between those two. Icon, through Newell Brands, buys up Bed Bath & Beyond, spins off Bye Bye Baby to Cohen. He merges that with Teddy, and that forms the foundation of Jamerica, which lights the fuse on the rocket for GameStop.
So how do you prove that fake shares exist? The company will tell you how many shares they have issued, they will call it the total outstanding share count. For example, here's GameStop's 10Q from June 2021, reporting 71,815,131 outstanding shares. But that is the number that is supposed to exist. If you think fake shares are being introduced into the system, that number is only useful to check your work. You have to do a share count. True, rigorous investigations of share counts occur so rarely that there isn't really a good comparison to draw from. At minimum, it's a hugely disruptive process that involves cooperation from basically every branch of the stock market. It's something GameStop lacks the authority to do themselves, and the mere mention of it might foster bearish sentiment. You know, suggesting to investors that their shares may be compromised with no basis for that belief. So it shouldn't be surprising that, to the best of our knowledge, GameStop hasn't acknowledged any part of the MOAS conspiracy. Directly. Wink wink nudge nudge. This means the apes are on their own to expose the conspiracy from the outside. The method apes first latch onto is via shareholder votes. We've already seen the issues that can arise from counting shares directly from the market. Totally normal business transactions can resemble illusionary shares, and it's not possible to work backwards to solve for the initial share count, especially when the number you're after contains an unknown amount of fake shares. When a shareholder loans their share for a short sale, they are owed a share. They still consider themselves a shareholder, but they lose access to their voting rights. Otherwise, you'd have one share providing two separate votes, if not more. That gives you a hint of where this is headed. One share translates to one vote, so if every shareholder is involved in a vote, the vote count should total precisely 100% of the outstanding share count. If the number exceeds 100%, that has to be the product of naked shorts, phantom shares, or dodgy voting. Overvoting is a real thing in corporate governance, and it's a whole complex topic that neither of us want to endure. Thankfully, the ape theory is extremely simple. They aren't trying to reveal a moderate discrepancy in the share count. They believe there are dozens of times more shares in circulation than intended, and that apes have already bought far, far, far more than the 72 million real shares. As the phrase goes, apes already own the float. We know we own the float. Let's set the scene here a little. It's April, May 2021. MOAS, as a theory, is still evolving rapidly, and GameStop has a corporate vote coming up on June 9th. Apes spend weeks whipping up support for the vote, promoting it all over Reddit, explaining how to submit your vote to your broker, and proclaiming it as an opportunity to really, truly, finally stick it to Wall Street, expose the criminal naked short attacks on GameStop, and trigger another squeeze. This was such a big deal that numerous apes traveled to Texas to attend the shareholder meeting in person, and thousands of apes tuned into the influencer live streams that treated this banal procedural vote with the gravitas of a major political election, waiting in suspense for the results. Present more than majority of all shared. Confirmed more than majority. Um, so, okay. So, so there are... Oh, so there are more shares. shares. Yeah, yes. more votes. They confirmed there are more shares. That's a hundred percent. No, no, no. They confirmed there are more votes than shares. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's more than a hundred percent. Yeah. If that's a direct quote, if you have that and that's sourced, that's it. Because if we're saying more than majority, majority is just fifty percent. No, no, no. It wasn't majority. They said more votes than outstanding shares. Oh shit! That's huge. I'm waiting for that 8K to come out and say. We had hundreds of percent, hundreds of percent more than mm -hmm. what we expected. I'm yeah. literally expecting hundreds of percentage more than. But that, in that aspect, more than a majority. If it outstands a float, it's still more than a majority. That's the legalese. Well, it, but it was more than more than majority last year too. Yeah. So it didn't work. GameStop didn't announce that nine times as many votes were cast as should have even been possible. They just kind of nodded at the fact that voter turnout was high. This is actually how DRS entered this story in the first place. Dr. Suzanne Trimbath, or 
Queen Kong, as the apes nicknamed her, has been promoting DRS to retail investors for 20 some odd years, and the utility here is the same as the vote. Since the number of shares that apes presume exist is some cartoonish multiple of the actual number, it should be trivial to demonstrate, and unlike the vote, this would cut brokers out of the picture entirely. Thus began an even more intense campaign to DRS GME and get GameStop to begin reporting the number of direct registered shares. This, this was a lock. Apes own the float after all. The crime is so vast that even mediocre participation will expose some truly unreasonable numbers. 80 million, 90 million, 300 million direct registered shares in a company that only has 72 million shares to begin with. And then, then comes the reckoning. Yeah, that one didn't pan out either. Okay, so the headband, maybe I should explain this. It's a, it's an homage, uh, like really everything I do is an homage to my hero, uh, DFV or Deep Fucking Value. And at this point, we need to talk about a man named Keith Gill, an instrumental figure in all of this, who those familiar with the story probably feel has been conspicuously absent up to this point. This is Keith Gill, aka DFV, aka Roaring Kitty. He is simultaneously extremely important to the ape movement and utterly inconsequential to our story, and for that reason it is worth profiling him in order to illustrate that contradiction. To some, he basically invented meme stocks, while to others he is merely the mouthpiece through which MOAS made itself known to the world. The reality, in contrast, is almost unrecognizable. In our reality, he is a registered securities broker who was working by day at the insurance broker Mass Mutual. In his spare time, he streams investment tutorials on YouTube under the alias Roaring Kitty and posts on Reddit under the handle Deep Fucking Value. Next slide. It is 2019, and Keith's hope is to become something of an investment influencer based on his Roaring Kitty investment philosophy, which, as the name suggests, is a small but aggressive strategy. Next slide. As the working subject for this, Keith has a theory inspired by a blog post written by Dr. Michael Burry that GameStop is undervalued. The idea is pretty straightforward and honestly rather modest. GameStop has been trending downward for several years, but has historically always seen a significant bump in value at the start of a new console generation, and the 9th gen consoles are on the horizon. Next slide. While well, consumer habits are shifting away from malls in general and aggressively to digital distribution for games in specific, and while GameStop's relationship with manufacturers and developers is no longer what it once was, Gill's opinion is the market is overly pessimistic about how much life is left in physical media. Long term, his view is that GameStop still has multiple opportunities to pivot the business to something more forward-looking, especially if they can expect a significant spike in revenue in the near future. This is an argument that GameStop is trading at $4 to $8, he feels it should be trading at $8 to $10, and has the capability of going reasonably higher as the 9th gen consoles carry the 2020 holiday season. That's what I think. I think about GameStop. I think it is, it is at least a double. I think it is probably a triple, but it legit could be uh, a 4 to 5 bagger. It could be looking out, I don't know, looking out 6 to 18 months or so. Um, yeah, so that's what I think. If you disagree with that, that's fine. I, I Like I said, I've been wrong about plenty of things in the past. Next slide. Of course, he couldn't have seen the coronavirus pandemic coming and how that would both decimate brick-and-mortar retail with malls getting hit particularly hard and stress supply lines for both the retailers and their vendors. Next slide. Gill chips away at this thesis for over a year, streaming about it regularly, posting stream highlights as standalone videos, and defending and refining the thesis in discussions with other traders on Reddit, even as the situation looks ever more dire for GameStop, as the 9th gen console launch is set to be hammered by problems all the way up and down the chain, from raw materials to shipping stoppages. Next slide. However, as the meme stock craze takes root, and in particular identifies GameStop's unusually high short interest as a possible squeeze play, Keith is already pretty deep in on GameStop and willing to ride it out, for which he is rewarded pretty handsomely. 
Here is Keith on Christmas Day 2020 discussing GameStop breaking his original optimistic price target of $20. Hey, what's up, everybody? Cheers! Happy Friday, happy holidays. I hope everyone's having a great week. Uh, surprise! <laughs> GameStop's up about 5x from when I uploaded those videos over the summer, so that's great to see when you have a thesis and, and by and large it unfolds as you hope that it could. Um, that's nice. So it shouldn't be taken for granted. It doesn't always happen. So um, that's great. And um, yeah, it's uh, just to clear up uh, some potential misconceptions. This this was a true YOLO for me <laughs> when when I was building this position uh, last year. We had nowhere close to a million dollars. Um, I certainly do not drive a Lambo. We rent this house that you that you see. So it's been a wild ride for us as a family. And um, and I I'm it has been just so much fun to experience that with you over the past couple of months. I hope you had uh, some some fun as well. And maybe if you if you even picked up on some educational elements along the way, all the better. But it has brought me tremendous joy to to just share in this what has turned out to be a bit of a case study, right? As some of us feel. And it has brought me tremendous joy. And, um, and, and if you have, have had a good time as well, that makes me feel great. Next slide. When all was said and done at the end of January, Keith quit his job and took home an estimated $25 million, for which Maxine Waters hauled his ass in front of Congress to answer some questions about what the hell happened and if, you know, he maybe did a bit of a pump and dump. Next slide. Keith accurately in my opinion, insisted that while he was a higher profile member of the wave, he was ultimately just another member of a decentralized movement and demonstrably had been personally advocating GameStop as a potential profitable move for well over a year. I also want to say that I support retail investors right to invest in what they want when they want. I support the right of individuals to send a message based on how they invest. As for me, I like the stock. I'm as bullish as I've ever been on a potential turnaround for GameStop, and I remain invested in the company. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Next slide. Apes read literally all of this as coded messaging. I like the stock became a shibboleth to signal commitment to the cause of Moas. Next slide. Gill read the room and wisely pieced out, while he continued to participate in the scene at an arm's length, tweeting vague nonsense mostly in the form of movie clips, the length of that arm grew longer and longer as apes grew increasingly disconnected from reality. Realizing that he was being elected to the role of cult leader, that anything he said, any company he commented on, would be baked and decoded as directions for the apes to take action on, and that such a position posed a substantial threat to both his newfound wealth and his personal safety should he fall afoul of either the SEC or the apes themselves, in late June of 2021, he unplugged his social media entirely and disappeared from the public eye. Next slide. Gill has been retroactively recruited into every twist and turn in the evolving ape lore. Everything that apes convinced themselves about naked shorts, married puts, the importance of failures to deliver, the need to DRS, has been imposed on Gill in absentia. Here, for example, is a post from May 2023, just shy of two full years after Keith's last public post that outright advocates for conspiratorial baking, refine your tinfoil until it is pure gold, and assumes absolute homogeneity between Keith's thesis and their own, which is to say that this poster believes DFV believes what they believe. Next slide. The poster signs off, of course, with Follow the White Rabbit. Next slide. Although he almost certainly sold most, if not all, of his stake in GameStop and rode off into early retirement to raise his family, apes remain convinced that he's still out there, hodling to this day, cheering them on from afar, if not guiding them from the shadows via Reddit awards. Like, can I, can I prove that, that like, DRS works? Yeah. Well, I mean, DRS has never been disproven. We just got to, you know, we just got to trust the plan. One of the things that gets litigated repeatedly in all of this mess is the definition of what makes a meme stock. I've actually got a conspiracy-laden email in my inbox that hinges off this. In January 2021, there was no such thing as a meme stock. Despite the SEC itself putting out a report, 
where they directly state that price movement was not related to shorts closing, there continues to be no definition of what a meme stock really is. However, examples of meme securities apparently include GME, AMC, and BBBY. The term meme stock in reference to GME seems like a tactical decision to deride GME investors without directly singling out a single company, ostensibly in order to avoid bringing more attention to the company whose success is immediately threatening to financial institutions. On one hand, meme stock is basically the new name for stocks that behave like penny stocks even if they aren't penny stocks, which is useful to a degree, and on the other hand is an attempt at identifying the why of meme stocks via a definition. Bed Bath & Beyond in an April 2023 court filing lists a couple of characteristics of a meme stock and why they felt it applied to them. The two characteristics that they identify are a general narrative of an imperiled company and nostalgia value. That's kind of a workable definition, but to cut through the noise, part of the problem with trying to pin down what a meme stock is, is that it's changed. A meme stock in 2023 isn't the same substance as a meme stock in 2021. The original meme stocks in the fall of 2020, AMC, Nokia, GameStop, BlackBerry, are defined by a gleeful contrarianism. It's not that there's a narrative of a company in trouble, though that is present in some cases, and it's not the nostalgia value, though that's also somewhat present too. Those were not the leading motives. What made a meme stock in 2020 is that aggressively, publicly, buying a stock in a failing company past its relevance is funny. The thing that truly separates a meme stock from every other garbage ticker is that the act of buying in and of itself becomes the meme, a combination of absurdist performance and inherently gamified exercise. In 2023, though, that wave has crested and broken. The joke is over, but the investors are still around, and as we'll see, the gleeful contrarianism is gone, replaced with stone-faced dedication to a perceived cause. So, what is a meme stock? It's a stock whose play rests entirely on a concocted narrative of a storied American company under assault that serves as a proxy battleground for the fate of the American economy, the vessel through which the true believers will manifest their apocalypse and rebirth the world into a golden age. It is a stock that is a candidate for MOAS. While any stock with a high short interest potentially meets this criteria, ultimately three businesses would rise to the top to become the canon meme stocks. GameStop, AMC Theaters, and Bed Bath & Beyond. Now, companies tend to have high short interest because they're in bad shape. Declining market share, lackluster product, poor reputation, loaded with debt, and probably the number one reason, they're unprofitable and not making money. So, it's important to note that the self-selection process here, the thought process created by the theory of MOAS, is going to intrinsically lead apes to invest in bad companies. Yeah, so I've thought about putting one of these together. Uh, I've thought about writing a DD. I mean, like, check out all of these awards you get. It's pretty long, you know, but like, that's good, that's good, right? Like, the longer it is, the more, uh, the more do the diligence. Following the vote, the apes were faced with their own fork in the road. Either they accept the results of their own test and acknowledge the prospect that they made a mistake, or they preheat the oven and prepare to bake justifications for why the overvote didn't occur. You don't need to be told which way they went. After the June 2021 shareholder meeting, there was a seismic shift in the tone of Superstonk. The goalposts shifted and damage control was engaged. Immediately, it began to circulate that an overvote was never going to be unveiled by the meeting, and it was in fact foolish to expect it to. Conspiracy theories formed to explain the lack of evidence of the conspiracy theory. Some apes were prevented from voting. Brokers normalized their vote counts before providing them to GameStop. GameStop isn't allowed to admit the overvote occurred. Whatever explains away the negative test result. The previous months of research became shockingly malleable, being rewritten the instant it produced an unfavorable result. And within a few months, history had just been straight up rewritten. The experiment did demonstrate the overvote, but nothing came of it. This is ape research, and it's worth an examination in its own right. 
Due diligence is the process of gathering a folio of data on a potential investment that explores the whole package, the company's financials, the state of their competition, likely technological or societal changes in the near future that could impact the course of the company for better or worse, how many people on the planet even theoretically want their product. It can get as intense as hiring someone to drive out into the woods just to make sure a mine actually exists. Because this is a real thing real investors do with a fancy sounding name, it quickly became an entire genre of post on ape forums. There is a delicate line for us to walk here. Learning and collaboration are good. I would love to stand here and tell you that apes came together and taught themselves how to invest and better each other's lives. It's a great story. Indeed, that's how the apes tell it. But this is not that. This is something very different. Making money on the stock market isn't difficult. A fish can do it. No one going long on biotech has a plan. But apes don't want portfolios that outperform the market. They want to manufacture events that cripple financial institutions while flipping off regulators. So ape due diligence, or DD for short, is rough. It is mythology cloaked in the veil of research. At the base layer, the first generation of apes have self-selected as victims of a pump and dump. It's a bad starting point because these people have demonstrated a lack of familiarity with the subject matter and poor judgment. Like a lot of victims of stock scams, many of them were denied a good education and many have a poor grasp of English. As a collective group, they were weaned on Keith Gill's YouTube channel, daily discussion threads on Wall Street bets, and very simple rhetorical signals. That's the kind of material they're trained to take in, and they still largely took it in by declaring, I'm just a smooth-brained ape. Can someone with a few wrinkles explain if my tits should be jacked? Rhetoric and the broad strokes are what matter. You need to understand that shorts never closed, you got a book rather than plan, and you need to hate Ken Griffin with every atom of your being. But paradoxically, apes sincerely believe they are collectively the Michael Burry in a sequel to The Big Short that has yet to be written. So while the details are irrelevant, they are driven to not just research, but produce their own original research. The majority of this early seminal DD was written by apes who joined the community well after January, many being verifiable bag holders, people who would be writing essays on securities fraud within two weeks of making their first trade. We know this because the authors will just flat out say it. Posts will often open with a short summary of why the author shouldn't be trusted. They will often admit that they barely understand the documents they're paraphrasing, but have attempted it anyway for the benefit of the community. The pitfalls are obvious. Like your standard breed of crackpot, apes are educating themselves to specifically solve a big problem. They are pursuing their chicken tenders. When they skipped the first three textbooks on finance and went straight to short-squeezing Melvin Capital, they skipped over some fundamentals. But you won't find Ken Griffin's secret strategy in an open access course on risk management. Rather than backtrack, apes forged ahead into increasingly complex and obtuse material looking for the truth. Like some of the crap we had to read. Furthermore, the lender is being asked to accept a new type of security interest, not the simple pledge, but one which perforce has to be a security interest in intangible property. The history of developing new security interests in purely intangible property is one that might give pause to even that rara avis, the adventuresome lender. When dealing with documents this intense, written by and for professionals, the only way a layman can deal with it is through decoding techniques. You pull out a fragment of a lecture or thesis that you can make sense of and treat it as the diamond in the rough. The rest is interpreted through speculation, rippling out from that fragment. It's a very unsound way to approach research, and these people then immediately present to the class. Analogy is a favorite of the ape author. Analogy in academia is used to bolster the substance, but since the apes were introduced to these ideas through the big short, analogies are load-bearing. Essentially using the same language as Margot Robbie, but you're expected to act on it. It's not just lightly informative entertainment, it is, in fact, financial advice. If the rocket is launched without preparation, it will bring down the whole fucking base. 
While the small explosives are going off and smaller players are going under, GME will have a lot more volatility. The powers that be will try to dampen that volatility as much as possible. Since even a small ignition could set this bitch off, I believe the plan is to do controlled detonations until GME is the only explosive left to set off. Computer share works a bit like a heat lamp, and what that actually means is an exercise for the reader. Their thought process is so shamefully reverse engineered that they need to make a joke out of the confirmation bias just to guard against that very real criticism. An unbelievable amount of their primary sources for the mechanics of clearing and settlement come from random emails to the SEC from 2003. Like, even if you presume that that material is accurate, consider all the obvious ways that a public comment on an upcoming piece of legislation could be unreliable 20 years after the legislation has been introduced. That is how you get the apes frothing over long-retired systems. They jumped in a time machine from the 2020s back to 2004 when we had the last hysteria about naked short-selling, which itself was built off a half-baked understanding of the subject from the 80s. This leaves gaps. The result of all of this is a truly spectacular rate of generational decay in the apes' collective understanding of the thing they have devoted their lives to understanding. Despite becoming an increasingly ambitious ploy, MOAS devolved into an incredibly simple scheme in just a few weeks. You just buy GameStop shares and hold until MOAS, and the infinity pool will ensure you become a guerrillionaire. Ape DD can only function to reproduce existing ideas or develop new mythology in reaction to new issues. Even the papers that look like they're doing the math boil down to buy and hold. It's a bad practice to cite a date or price for MOAS, so the only accepted values are soon and infinite. And all of this is regulated by the mechanism of social media. Some of this may be evoking memories of QAnon, and while the overlap between the two movements is non-trivial, for the most part it is simply that, as a social media-driven phenomenon, its ideas are shaped by populism and Reddit's algorithm. DD that the community approves of is showered with Reddit awards, praise, and clout, so there's an incentive, emotional and in some cases monetary, to, you know, have more DD. Adabit was a late arrival to the squeeze. The account's first post was on the 10th of March, and by the 14th he posted his first amateur securities fraud essay. By April 22nd, he posted the first in a series called House of Cards that apes pumped to the point that it was temporarily the top post on Reddit. And naturally, it is almost entirely gawking at emails from 2003. Adabit was conferred a level of status that would see him named alongside the Queen Kong herself as among the movement's most prestigious thinkers. He became something of an influencer, complete with his own perpetually unfinished magnum opus, which, tragically, we will never get. He didn't acquire this reputation through good work. He did that by giving the apes what they wanted. For DD to be accepted, it needs to be simple. It can be long, but the whole thing needs to be fully summarized in 100 words max, because the most important thing is that it needs to reinforce the existing belief system, and no one will read your DD if you don't tell them you agree with them at the outset. All of this is enforced through the upvote button. DD that meets the community's criteria gets elevated, DD that muddies the water, or worse, spreads fear, uncertainty, and doubt, is aggressively suppressed. Regardless of the rigor of any individual essay, this is academia via populism. It is the ideal circumstances for critical thought to be suspended. The apes get to pick and choose what facts shape their thesis, and in doing so, they create mythology. This is why the MOAS theory can stand tall on a foundation of sand and vapor. The actual mechanics are interchangeable. Initially, they misunderstood how 140% short interest could occur. That led them to the stock borrow program. And while it proved their original theory wrong, it gave them a better alternative. So even though the stock borrow program is baked into the core thesis, it doesn't matter. They can substitute it with half a dozen different things. The failure of the overvote just proves how rigged 
rigged the system truly is. Each theory is just a stepping stone to the next. They can never be proven wrong if they never sit still long enough for someone to debunk them. Real due diligence is as much an argument to stay away from an investment as it is an argument to buy in. Good due diligence will argue the worst case scenario. What if things go completely wrong? What if a new product just sucks ass and no one wants it? Can the company weather bad news or will it fold in half? ApeDD exists to keep MOAS alive. As time went on, decoding became a more and more explicit form of DD. This started innocently enough initially. Keith Gill, Ryan Cohen, and Michael Burry were subtweeting apes very explicitly. Whether it was Ryan Cohen's official statements thanking retail investors for their support, or Gill communicating with apes through gifts, these were thinly veiled messages to apes. But they weren't substantive. There was not a deep meaning to Ryan Cohen tweeting a fist emoji or reposting an ape meme about himself. But this normalized the idea that these figures communicated with apes through secret messages. And since these guys were never available to clarify or disprove theories, it cultivated decoding techniques that grew more and more ambitious. DFV Roaring Kitty Tweet Deciphered 1627 has to do with naked shorting options derivative cases, which ties directly in which SEC rule 10b-21. Can you explain the connection just so my dumbass can follow? All I'm coming up with is a couple of legal cases. Beyond that, I don't know. Are we saying this painting is from 1627? This painting is from a Wes Anderson movie. But the Roman numeral on the right side is for 1627. How's that tied to naked shorting? GME, Rick and Morty, how the show might be hinting at us about the financial system and the collapse of Citadel via their own greed? This is how the 1% sees us! Candidly, I have seen no evidence so-called fake or synthetic shares exist, but many of you disagree. I love it. Basically saying, who am I to say the hedge funds are creating shares out of thin air? I guess we'll just pull back the curtain to see. Adam Aaron saying there's no evidence of synthetics is actually genius. Just think about it. When he does pounce, they can't go after him for market manipulation. Because he'll have evidence of the exact opposite. To a person with autism, words mean something. Every word does. Every symbol, every unwritten suggestive wink or nudge. We're really good at giving clues and seeing deeper meaning. I say we because I have Asperger's. We notice patterns and algorithms that normal people don't. And cryptic language is often our bread and butter. Yes, DFB, MJ Burry, even Papa Cohen are communicating with apes the only way they can. Through cryptic means. And their messages are important. Remember, every word means something to an autist. No surprise that by June, Keith Gill stopped tweeting altogether. It got to the point where AMC CEO Adam Aaron dropped his phone and tweeted out a single M, and apes became fixated on decoding it. Despite Aaron's efforts to dispel the fervor, Aaron's statements just fed into the idea that the M was significant. Yesterday, I tweeted an M, by mistake. But many of you thought I was being less than candid in the denial, and that the M must have meant something. Nope, just a tweeting error. But today, I am tweeting this, and it does mean something. Why? Question for the tinfoils. Why did he leave that much space, what is it, 10? Between text and Y? I think it's 11. I can't figure it out. Ryan Cohen, the chairman of the board of GameStop, took one photo with notorious corporate raider Carl Icahn, the guy Oliver Stone based Gordon Greed is Good Gecko off of in 1987, which immediately cast Icahn as a savior figure in dozens and dozens of DDs. As conspiratorial techniques like this became more popular and more dominant on these boards, the line between vetted DD and speculation began to blur. Now, the solid AF DD was already built on the same foundation of sand as outright speculation, but there was still a clear shift over time. After the failed shareholder vote, naturally more and more radical explanations were required. All of these exist to answer the same question, 
Where's the evidence of the fake shares? Why aren't we seeing the answer we expect to see? The answer is almost always that the debt or shares were shifted into some new form previously unknown to apes. Since the ape understanding of the market is rooted very firmly in the realm of Googling, wrinkle brain explains short squeeze, that is, most things. So we start to see more and more out there instruments being introduced. They start talking about dark pools, options, ETFs, and so on, folding that material into a more and more pure thesis based on the naked short conspiracy. Maintaining a stable community built entirely out of conspiracy, insecurity, and resentment is tricky. To get them through this, apes police sentiment like few others. Even crypto, a product wholly at the mercy of sentiment, is more tolerant of bad news than apes because they are nominally willing to engage with reality as it exists. They'll spin bad news like the collapse of FTX as good for the ecosystem as a whole, pretending that it's culling out bad actors, but they don't deny that FTX has gone sour. Since MOAS is basically a fantasy untethered from any real business fundamentals, the reasons to not buy in get longer and longer as time goes on, and so the restrictions on what is and isn't permissible to talk about also grow longer and longer. MOAS is, when you break it down, market manipulation via the prisoner's dilemma. The big theoretical payout only works if literally everyone holds the line, but simultaneously everyone involved has both the personal incentive and ample opportunity to screw over the others, and knows that everyone else has that same opportunity. It is a philosophy that demands extremely strict orthodoxy. You buy and you hold. Discussing exit strategy is derided as price anchoring. Remember, the gains are not theoretically infinite, they are literally infinite. This leads directly to unhinged memes about apes becoming guerrillionaires from selling one single share. It leads to stories about the post-MOAS world where apes don't actually need to sell any shares at all, ever. They just live off the dividends from GameStop for the rest of their lives and for the lives of their children and their children's children. A future where one single share confers wife-changing generational wealth. Sharp-eared listeners may have noticed that I said dividend in there, and they may be asking the logical follow-up question. Where does the money for these dividends come from? Don't worry about it. In fact, why are you so concerned with what other people do with their money? Are you just here to spread FUD and undermine GME? I'm just an individual investor who likes the stock and the company that is debt-free and cash flow positive, backed by an unprecedented movement from shareholders to direct register their shares in order to combat corruption in the DTCC. FUD is literally anything that casts any amount of doubt on any part of the plan. I don't believe that GameStop will be worth an unlimited amount of money per share. That doesn't seem possible. FUD! Why wouldn't the price peak and then come back down? FUD! I should probably set an exit threshold because I'm pretty sure other people are going to be selling too and I don't want to miss the opportunity. FUD! No, but for real, where does the money for these dividends come from? FUD! Direct registration mutated extremely quickly from an attempt at proving the existence of concrete crimes with objective numbers, a thing it failed to do, into a loyalty ritual, a spell that if executed correctly would create the conditions that would allow MOAS to happen. A specific quirk of the narrative of MOAS, the idea that the apes are engaged in a phantom war with the short hedge funds, leads to various delusional but logically consistent outcomes, like the belief that anyone who is not on board with the play is a hired agent of the opposition. The rubberneckers mocking apes on r slash GME meltdown aren't merely trolls, contrarians, or naysayers, but hired shills planted in ape communities as part of an elaborate psyops to undermine them and convince them to sell their shares so that the shorts can cover, which is of course predicated on the belief that there's no real shares available, which is predicated on the belief that there's some truly unfathomable amount of undetectable naked shorts, which etc etc etc. This is a clever word inversion. An actual shill is someone who stands off to the side of a grift and acts as an unrelated hype man. They posture as just a random independent passerby while actually having an undisclosed interest in the thing that they are helping to sell. A shill wants you to buy something. 
Naturally, Superstonk and the other derivative forums are deeply infested with shills, literally telling people to buy and promoting the virtue of never, ever selling for any reason ever. Here's a DD post literally structured for recruitment from Reddit's front page. The reason the DD posts have so many awards is because apes believe they could abuse the system to shill GME to r slash all. They're not coordinating, though. They're all just individual investors coming to their own conclusions about what to do with their Reddit awards. In light of the community being 98% shilling by volume, it became culturally expedient to redefine the word so that all the shills would stop being accurately called shills. So in ape circles, a shill is any unbeliever. Predictably, this arrangement, where anyone who isn't frothingly committed to the cause is a hired shill, fosters an air of paranoia and has a rather extreme chilling effect on the idea of, you know, asking very reasonable questions that would be extremely normal in any other investment forum. This paranoia extends to policing maintenance of the illusion that this is all just an organic, uncoordinated series of individual decisions. Everyone's like, I want to make a lot of money. Let me do a bunch of research. And they're like, hey, here's what I found out. Everyone's like, yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. And then like we realized, oh, crap. All of our predictions we've made as a group individually, then as a group confirmed and vetted and, and picked apart and the best rose to top. And, and that's how you get research. It's like the perfect experiment. This feeds both the narrative that their behavior is not a mass hypnosis, but is instead the product of genuine rigor. And this has the added bonus of providing a basis to deter accusations of market manipulation. Now, while it's true that it's unlikely that we'll see a RICO filed with 20,000 John Doe defendants, apes seem aware that they're playing close to the fire. They are looking to collectively engineer an artificial price movement, which, would absolutely get you in trouble if you did it solo, so they lean into the decentralized nature of the movement as best they can, and it's, it's very funny. Edit two, removed some wheeze, etc. from my exit strategy after concerns were raised that phrasing my exit strategy like I originally did might be construed as attempted market manipulation. In the end, anyone reading this is just an individual ape doing whatever they want with their own money. Users will encant, this is not financial advice, and I just like the stock, with the same energy as no copyright infringement intended in the description of a complete upload of Dances with Wolves to YouTube. It's not financial advice, not legal advice for entertainment educational purposes only, anything I say is my opinion. Please don't make any financial decision based on anything I say in these videos. That being said, hit the like button, subscribe button, like YouTube algorithm stuff. So you get a video that I put them out. See, I'm thinking see man lots of data, but I got tail every day. The day they release us is false, man. They give us a false narrative market so we can make bad trade and so listen. So the point is GameStop is operating smarter than ever before. And that's what people just don't understand yet. That's the public eye just doesn't see. And it's because of all the mainstream media FUD. And that's just why I think the mother of all short squeezes is inevitable. Of course, this is just my opinion. You literally should take my opinion with a grain of salt. I'm telling you a stock is gonna go way up because a lot of people like it. And I am just a guy on the internet. Why would you believe me? They don't collude. Instead, there's an abstract infinity pool that happens to describe the abstract notions of shares that will never be sold. It speaks to their insecurity on whether they're safe to be doing this. And that concern is probably well-founded. Because, sure, the U.S. government wrote off the GME squeeze as a one-off viral event and let everyone off the hook, but if the apes get their wish and really do deliberately risk collapsing the U.S. or global economy after several years of organizing, yeah, I think the U.S. federal government would sooner make that RICO filing than give you slash Hopalos literally billions of dollars for his shares in GameStop. The whole of ape culture is persuasive in no small part because of how it plays off existing social anxieties. We are collectively primed for these narratives by a complicated soup of messages, a combination of distrust in financial institutions married with a mythologization of the stock market and a financial reality of stagnant wages and greedflation that make it feel like playing the market is the only possible way to build any kind of wealth or comfort. And that's just the stuff that's rooted in reality. Ape motivations are ultimately pretty simple. Their lore is complex, but their reasons are not. They're gambling addicts who are starved for social attention. 
The whole meme stock ecosystem actually makes a ton of sense for why it's as motivating as it is, since it combines all the addictive highs of gambling with all the energy of a soap opera. Every day there's something new. There's the constant drama of the price action ups and downs, though mostly downs. If it's not price action, then it's new theories, new DD, new moderator drama. It's very easy to compartmentalize as entertainment, to forget what's at stake is, you know, the family finances. Money is really easy to abstract away at the best of times, and it only gets easier when it's reduced and gamified, and when so much of it is irony-poisoned performance. Apps like Robinhood have already come under criticism for their gamification of playing the market, but even if that weren't a factor, the apes are more than happy to gamify things for one another and frame everything in the language of video games, the language of boss fights, grinding, and completionism. That's already addictive, and it just upgrades to weapons-grade bad times when combined with conspiratorial mindsets and the attendant narcissism, paranoia, and overconfidence. Gordon Pennycook, an associate professor at the University of Regina, in his pre-publication paper Overconfidently Conspiratorial, argues that the actual defining trait of the conspiratorially minded isn't narcissism or a need to feel special, though those are observably common traits in conspiracy circles, but excessive overconfidence. This is anecdotally intuitive to anyone who has spent significant time in conspiracy circles, but it is this overconfidence that leads to the refusal to reevaluate beliefs, the assumption that they accurately understand complicated systems better than others, and this is to me the most interesting claim of the paper a counterintuitive belief that their opinion is, in fact, in the majority. The entire thing with apes policing negative sentiment is actually a pretty good example of that, in the way that they have an itchy trigger finger for calling anyone, even longtime DD writers, a paid shill if they say anything negative or disagree with a favored theory. In the ape mind, the only possible reason to express doubt that GameStop is being attacked by short sellers who are trying to kill the company in order to prevent MOAS is because you're being paid to. The ape thesis is, to them, so self-evident, so persuasive, that it's just common sense. Everyone already believes it. Inevitably, this leads to pinnacle echo chamber behavior. No one outside the bubble can be trusted. Anyone talking about apes is engaging in psychological warfare to wear apes down, because why else would you care about apes or find this interesting or newsworthy? The inevitable synthesis of this thinking is a warped worldview where companies no longer go out of business for any reason other than targeted destruction. Sears, Blockbuster, Toys R Us, hell, Enron get retroactively cast as the victims of short sellers. This is a lens on the world necessary to recast ape behavior, their quest for infinite wealth, not as self-serving greed, but as altruism. Virtue has been a part of the rhetoric since the game stop squeeze itself. Investors were engaged to buy and hold to get revenge for 2008 and finally let the little guy have his fair share. We won't say that people didn't genuinely believe that, but you can imagine how useful that narrative would be to convince apes to hold while you personally divest your entire stake at $400 a share. The continuing escalation of the antagonism of Wall Street has fed the apes' sense of morality. They are very much the good guys who are saving the world by holding shares in GameStop, but at the same time, they have, you know, ulterior motives. They want destructive amounts of money. They do that vile thing where every share is a tribute to certain deceased individuals, you know, a tribute that involves doing the thing that they already wanted to do hold GameStop shares. Sandwich, this is a tribute to my grandpa. Rest in peace, Jack. This creates fascinating and harrowing conflicts in the ape mindset. Some apes are here just for the money and find the activism or philanthropic elements to be cringeworthy. But in the fiction, they are literally involved in an invisible war against the most powerful entities on the planet, and are so in order to free us from our oppression. When they take the reins of the economy, they are going to do it right and be just sovereigns. It's a full-blown savior complex. 
We will make the world better. Whether it be locally, statewide, nationally, or globally, we are here to fix the world that Wall Street and the bad boomers broke. We will use our tendies for good. And perhaps get a Lambo in the process. Or in my case, a motherfucking Cybertruck. But at the same time, they see the immense payout of MOAS as the reward for the tribulations they have endured. Billions of dollars in remuneration for the disappointed side eyes they catch at family gatherings. They resent the fact that no one takes them seriously, and their philanthropy exists in tension with a very intense urge to rub all our noses in it when they're eventually proven right. Because we all had our chance. Beyond the toys you're going to buy, who are you going to help? That's what matters. Because... There are plenty of people to help. Now, you can't help everybody. You can't go save everybody from working a nine to five. They had their chance, okay? They could have got in. They could have done their DD. They could have done their research. We tried to tell them over dinner. They didn't listen. Whatever. They had their chance. <laughs> okay. Because apes are so disconnected from actual fact, reality has been happy to deliver them an endless supply of great disappointments, week after week after week of failed catalysts, missed hype dates, deconstructed gamma ramps, and falling stock price, as the stock price of these unprofitable companies continues to decline from their short squeeze peaks. It's just... It's kind of really, really funny to watch this mass of people so deeply convinced that a drop in the value of GameStop is a direct attack on them when GameStop is currently valued well above even their most profitable years ever. As with any other apocalyptic belief placed under cognitive strain, this leads to aggressive fragmentation. One group says that DRS is the way, but apes just haven't been doing it properly, and an argument breaks out about plan accounts versus book accounts. Another group says that plan versus book doesn't matter. All that matters is apes need to DRS harder. Both groups accuse the other of being paid shills, employed to distract, fragment, and mislead the community. A late game DD theory is the belief in a turnaround play, that MOAS won't happen per se, but Bed Bath & Beyond or GameStop or hilariously, some speculative merger of the two will achieve MOAS-like valuations based entirely off strong fundamentals. And the MOAS is irrelevant because what GameStop is building is a great company. GME purists hold to a pure form of MOAS that's firmly rooted in spiritual loyalty to GameStop, which rapidly turned into a spiritual loyalty to Ryan Cohen. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, I didn't actually buy until March, but you know, I was reading the DD, then, you know, Ryan Cohen, he makes this play into Bed Bath & Beyond and everybody on the boards just gets like super hype about it. And, uh, and yeah, like anything the man touches is gold. Like he's, he's a kingmaker. He's the book king. So who is Ryan Cohen? Ryan Cohen is a bored billionaire who fancies himself an activist investor and a fixer of failing companies. He made his money selling the online pet food store Chewy.com to PetSmart, which he founded with a combination of venture capital and daddy's money. The official story of Chewy admits that they didn't get outside investment until 2013, but they hired a bunch of executives from Amazon and PetSmart right out the gate, and those suckers aren't cheap, so logical deduction is that, you know, there was already some money there. Next slide, please. Ryan Cohen ran Chewy as a tech company, burning venture capital and running at a loss until they were bought out for $3.35 billion in 2017. When the company went public in 2019, the company disclosed a $268 million loss for fiscal year 2018, Cohen's final year as CEO. Next slide. In September 2020, as the meme stock wave was gaining steam, he disclosed that he held a 10% stake in GameStop, believing that the company could be turned around. Cohen wrote an open letter to the GameStop board in November, proclaiming his immense faith in GameStop's potential if they would only take his advice. On Thursday, December 17th, 2020, he increased his stake to 12.9%. All three of these events were catalysts for GME. In August, GameStop was trading below $5. By the end of the year, it would be around 19 Next slide, please. An activist investor is an investor who buys stock off the open market and then throws their weight around and tries to take an active role in the running of the company, despite the fact that they didn't actually give any money to the company. Next slide. On January 11th, 2021, it was announced that Cohen would join GameStop's board of directors, and then in April, Cohen was made the chairman. Cohen made bold promises of a transformation into the Amazon of gaming. Next slide, please. 
Objectively, Ryan Cohen isn't good at actually running companies or generating shareholder value. GameStop's turnaround has resulted in a large amount of capital wasted on fulfillment centers that were closed shortly thereafter, a further retraction of the company from their global operations, and the launch of an NFT marketplace that the company describes in its 10K annual report as, quote, not material to the consolidated financial statements for fiscal 2022. Next slide. Ryan Cohen's one material impact on any business he's involved in as an activist investor is that he is followed by apes who, based on his limited role in the January 2021 run, have elevated him to a messianic role, believing that he is working behind the scenes to engineer MOAS and thus follow his investments. Next slide. This irrationally passionate fan base has succeeded in keeping GameStop hovering at an absurd valuation well above the company's actual financial performance, but they're also highly annoying, a burden for management to deal with, and a possible threat to employees. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go to this store here and ask if they are hiring. Let's see what they, what they say. That's Ryan Cohen uh, strategy. Oh yeah. I like the guy. I don't know if you like him, but I, I like him so much. You know who I'm are you, are talking about. you really interested in? You know who I'm talking about, right? No. You never heard about Ryan Cohen? There's, rings a, name rings a bell. So that, if you're working in GameStop, that name should ring <laughs> everything. Uh, it's, it's too early, see? So right now, what I notice is a lot of layoffs in Bed Bath & Beyond and a lot of recruiting, aggressively recruiting people in GameStop. Yeah. Most likely there will be a merger between GameStop and Bed Bath & Beyond wow. into I, a bigger I company. I don't even know how that works because GameStop sells games at Bed Bath & Beyond. The whole, the whole thing is going to change. All right, so that's the plan. So GameStop is merging with Bed Bath & Beyond and Ryan Cohen, he's not joking. He's not sitting as a chairman in this company GameStop playing with his balls no he's not he is hiring aggressively hiring retail people and the merger is coming when the only one who knows this answer is Ryan Cohen apes have taken to decoding any and all communication from Cohen for any coincidences that they can point to as indications that he is doing what they claim he is because it would be very bad news for apes if he were in fact just some rich loser who enjoys the attention next slide please no one wants to work with him given the poor material performance of gamestop relative to its inflated share value retailers bed bath and beyond and nordstrom both told him to go take a hike after he attempted to buy his way into power you know, really, at the end of the day, the hedge funds, like, they should have seen this coming. Like, they targeted gamers, you know? We, we know what it means to just, like, grind a boss fight and, and like, you know, grind reputation in, uh, in a video game. And so, like, you know, locking the float, uh, we can grind that out. We know what that takes. Uh, DRSing everything, you know, all of it. Uh, we, we can do that. Compared to GameStop and AMC, companies with products for kids and teens that at least have some connection to the nostalgia of youth, Bed Bath & Beyond seems like a curveball, until you realize that the apes just followed GameStop's savior to his next project. When Cohen first disclosed his stake in Bed Bath, the resulting ape frenzy triggered Bed Bath's largest intraday percentage price increase since its initial public offering. Some investors bought in due to uncritical zealotry towards Cohen or belief that the Bed Bath play was a MOAS master stroke. Others believed he would genuinely rescue the company, while others just wanted to get in early on the next pump and dump. Whatever the specific reason, we're only talking about Bed Bath and Beyond because of Cohen. Cohen bought into Bed Bath because it was a dying company he thought he could save. It's cut and dry. Likewise, there is no nuance to Bed Bath's troubles. It's a brick and mortar retailer that was struggling for all the obvious reasons. Already declining sales, a failed pivot to private label goods, the pandemic and subsequent supply chain disruptions, poor relations with their vendors, and a disastrous stock buyback program loading the company with debt created a negative feedback loop where the company couldn't stock its shelves. The company reached the point of allegedly turning off the air conditioning to save money. Why Ryan Cohen thought he could write this ship is anyone's guess, but it's fair to say that he didn't have much tangible impact one way or the other. 
Presumably, he intended to rapidly work his way up the chain as he did with GameStop. Instead, the board resisted Cohen's influence, and within weeks, Cohen and the company had settled on an agreement to prevent a hostile takeover attempt. Cohen was fixated mainly on Bed Bath's Baby Supply subsidiary Bye Bye Baby, insisting that, under the right circumstances, Baby could be valued on a revenue multiple like other e-commerce-focused retailers and justify a valuation of several billion dollars. The claim, already loaded with caveats, was based on a years-old internal evaluation by Bed Bath, and we know now that it was hogwash. Baby was incapable of standing on its own without the subsidization of Bed Bath's supply chain, but this number is still cited by apes over a year later. So in August, he decided to divest his interest in Bed Bath, but did so in a way that the kids might call... sus. Cohen initially bought a 9.8% stake in the company, which needs to be disclosed via the filing of a Schedule 13D. But in the time following Cohen's purchase, Bed Bath was in the process of carrying out a share buyback, which reduced the number of outstanding shares and increased Cohen's ownership to 11.8% without him personally trading. As a seemingly irrelevant preamble, on August 12th, Cohen tweeted, at least her cart is full, moon emoji, in reply to a scathing CNBC article about Bed Bath. He was required to update all the paperwork on his ownership by the end of April 2022, but didn't file the necessary Form 3 indicating a 10% or greater ownership until after the close of trading on August 15th. By now, it should be clear that apes aren't very good at all this. So when they saw this, they either thought Cohen bought more shares, or that, in concert with the tweet, he was signaling them to buy more, to fill up their carts, moon emoji. On the following morning, before trading opens, Cohen then updates his Schedule 13D to reflect the new number. Apes, again, see this as bullish AF and go crazy, driving up a Bed Bath's share price by 70% over the course of August 16th. Cohen then submits a Form 144 to the SEC stating that he hadn't bought or sold any Bed Bath shares in the last three months, but was maybe intending to. After this submission, Cohen then divests himself of all of his Bed Bath shares, reportedly pocketing $68 million in profit on his initial investment. The Form 144, stating Cohen's intention to sell, goes public the following day on the 17th. This spreads mass ape confusion. Finally, on the 18th, Cohen amends the Schedule 13D and Form 4 to reflect his sale of his Bed Bath shares two days earlier. And that ends Cohen's long-term involvement with Bed Bath after about nine months. Now, whether this constituted misconduct from Ryan Cohen is not a question we can answer, but it is a question worth asking. Unfortunately, we may never get an answer, because while a lawsuit against Ryan Cohen on this matter is ongoing, it's a mess. A self-represented ape raced to the courts in less than a week to file a class action lawsuit that put forth an unhinged account of this situation. According to the complaint, Ryan Cohen had been planning this from the beginning as part of a conspiracy with Bed Bath's CFO, who the complaint misnames repeatedly, and also JP Morgan was in on it for some reason. It's bad. The complaint is littered with factual errors, applies the wrong laws, and is just a train wreck from end to end. The case was wrestled off of the ape, and an amendment was submitted that looks like this, but there's only so much the new team can do to alter the original complaint, so it's unlikely that anything meaningful will come of it. If a jury were to find that Cohen's behavior was a deliberate effort to inject misinformation into the market, it would be a textbook example of actual market manipulation. It would be a situation in which retail investors would be compensated for damages caused by said manipulation. Yet, remarkably, despite this being a lawsuit focusing on giving the apes money, the loyalty of many of the apes remains with Cohen, so they cheer against the success of the class action. This is the end of Ryan Cohen's involvement with Bed Bath & Beyond. We aren't aware of him so much as mentioning it in the time since a one-off interview in November of 22. You know, my, my views changed of, of the business and ultimately I sold. And yet, rather than apes accepting what's just happened to them, that their supposed genius activist investor who would make them all rich lured them into buying shares in a dying retailer, apes 
started to bake. The decoding goes up a whole new level. At this point, there is absolutely no communication from Cohen regarding Bed Bath & Beyond, so they need to both uncover the secret messages and then decode them. Cohen said he was in Bed Bath for the long term and then bailed inside nine months. Did he lie? Did he rapidly pivot when things didn't go his way? Or was that initial statement always intended to reassure apes that he was in on the play regardless of how it appeared. The myth quickly became that Cohen didn't abandon the apes or give up on Bed Bath. Instead, Cohen had to work from the shadows to outmaneuver both the Bed Bath board themselves, who didn't want anything to do with him, and the short sellers. This is when we get that Carl Icahn tweet. Apes took this to be definitive evidence of a partnership between Cohen and Icahn, whose end game was to merge GameStop and Bed Bath into a competitor to Amazon. Deal's already done. Oh. Uh, we still don't know where Icahn's son is at. Mm -hmm. um, RC's yet to reveal himself. Icahn has to be involved himself. Oh yeah, look at IEP <laughs> falling, man. The timing of everything, man. Yeah, Come man. on, they like these people who don't believe in this shit. They want to try to psych you out and believe gaslight you in the shit. But honestly, man, the timeline matches up. So honestly, man, I'm taking the, I'm taking yeah. the gamble personally. So there it is. <laughs> and then. And then in November of 22, Cohen publishes a series of children's books called Teddy. These are mediocre pro-capitalist pablum, basically exactly what you'd expect from a billionaire libertarian who is bored out of his mind and desperate for the approval of others. Apes, of course, fired up the industrial ovens and got ready to bake like they'd never baked before. Ryan's children's books are actually hidden messages for us. Just look at those titles. China, money, running the world, words can't hurt you, as in FUD. <laughs> it's the only way he can legally communicate with us. <laughs> My daily tinfoil, what's up with the pattern on Teddy's signature shirt? I know people think these Easter eggs are wrong, but I believe the deal was closed on the 10th, Teddy Day. And the 13th, Teddy's belt buckle, is when the filing will drop. Also, Merger Monday. China is an anagram of Icon. Teddy goes to China? That means Ryan has approached Icon about a lucrative partnership. The books teach literal children to not put all their eggs in one basket, which of course means GME holders should also buy Bed Bath & Beyond. When it's 150, the clock hands point to 10 and 2, which means that any alignment of 10, 2, 12, 1, and 50 become valid readings of the hidden code. If you save your money, you can buy ice cream, which clearly means if you hold, then you get your treats, which is another signaling of tendies. I want to be the book king? Clearly he wants us booking our shares. General So's chicken? Tokenized security offerings. It was rumored that Cohen was going to be buying a stake in Alibaba, the Amazon of China. But then also Cohen tweeted about James Cameron's Titanic, one of the most popular and successful films in the history of human existence, and apes took this as an obscure reference to a potential announcement. And wouldn't you know it? February 2, 10th, 10, 2023 is both National Teddy Bear Day and the re-release of Titanic. There are too many coincidences. This is it. This is Teddy Day. Ryan Cohen is going to be announcing an acquisition of Bed Bath & Beyond with his good friend China, Reed Iken, where he's going to spin off Bye Bye Baby and merge with GameStop to form Gamerica. Exactly. And the shills call it all crazy conspiracy theories. Fucking RC can't just come out and say, oh, hey guys, I'm working on an M&A deal with Bye Bye Baby. Get ready to be rich on a specifically called out date. He said all he could say through the books. If you are really patient, one day you will have money to eat all the ice cream you want while taking care of your family and friends. So as I do it here and I, and I see it, guys, these guys are expanding their catalog, but without throwing up the flare. <laughs> hey, we're getting bigger. So now what can happen for GameStop? GameStop can absorb Teddy at any time. And in verse, they already have it all set out. The map is there. He's been building it in secret behind everyone else. And now you have a partnership. So let's take a moment to marinate on this, to consider just how far we've really come. We've gone from vaguely legitimate, if poorly understood and ill-defined theories on market mechanics, to staring at illustrations of an old man fumbling a turkey in order to extract coded financial advice from the patterns on his shirt. 
There's really only one way this can go. It is a reality that businesses often make poor decisions, misdirecting company resources to wasteful pet projects or failing to adapt to changes in taste, technology, and society. So we've reached a point where apes are convinced that Ryan Cohen is going to swoop in and buy out Bed Bath & Beyond. Their evidence for this is overwhelmingly based on secret messages delivered to them via literal children's books. Their grasp on reality has totally frayed at this point. Every Bed Bath statement was a coded message. All bad news was just to throw off the short sellers. This meant that as Bed Bath continued to decline, the apes looked at it with distrust and confusion. In January 2023, Bed Bath & Beyond defaulted on a loan payment, and on February 1st, they missed an interest payment on three tranches of bonds. This is bad. This is, we are completely out of money levels of bad. In response to this, they were approached by a firm, Hudson Bay Capital Management, who presented them with a deal that was completely insane. The deal is commonly referred to as death spiral financing, and if a Lucifer appeared alongside Hudson Bay at that moment and offered Bed Bath an alternative deal, it'd be the same. These deals are the last resort, where the investor will offer a shockingly small amount of capital up front, and in exchange, they get to decimate the stock price to whatever extent is necessary for them to earn their return. A company signing a deal like this is the unambiguous signal that they've exhausted every alternative. The basic arrangement of the deal is that Hudson gets preferred convertible shares from Bed Bath for a lump sum of money. Then these preferred shares can be converted into common shares that Hudson can immediately sell on the open market, with the number of shares generated based on the lump sum divided by the recent average value of a share, with a sweet discount just to make sure that Hudson always has a profit margin. These are called death spiral financing because they're a recipe for massive share dilution. The financer buys preferred shares for a fixed sum, converts those into a variable number of shares, and then dumps those shares onto the market, almost certainly lowering the share price via dilution alone, if not compounding negative sentiment and massacred investor confidence. The share price going down means that the next preferred share they convert will convert into even more common shares, which will further lower the price, which will convert the next block into even more shares, and over and over. In a mere six and a half weeks, Hudson more than quadrupled the number of Bed Bath & Beyond shares in existence. Apes diamond-handed buy at any cost irrationality, their stubbornness, the very thing that apes tout as their secret weapon against the hedgies, is the exact thing Hudson was counting on to turn their profit. The grim irony is that apes are so predictably irrational in their made-up war against hedge funds and short sellers that it leaves them open to all manner of unique and awful exploitation at the hands of hedge funds and short sellers. The irony is so deep you could drown in it. The capital Hudson Bay offered was used to pay down debt. There was nothing left to fix any of the structural problems with the business, so the only thing the deal bought them was time. The Hudson Bay deal was terminated after less than two months as Bed Bath stock price fell under a dollar and showed no signs of recovery. And through this, the whole time, apes denied that dilution was happening, denied that it was the cause of the decline in the share price, denied that Hudson Bay Capital was the buyer, mocked the Wall Street Journal's use of inside sources familiar with the matter, and denied that Bed Bath & Beyond was even in the precarious position that Bed Bath was actively warning them of. We need the proceeds from the transactions to pay our outstanding obligations under our credit facilities and senior notes, and to operate our business. And we expect that we will likely file for bankruptcy protection if the transactions are not consummated. The issuance of the securities in this offering will significantly dilute the ownership interest of the existing holders of our common stock. Trading in our securities is highly speculative and poses substantial risks to investors. This is the context in which Heat Lamp is produced, a conspiracy whose every element is reverse engineered to offer a semblance of hope. Critically incurious, Heat Lamp is baseless speculation that squares the circle and explains away the continued failure of apes to crash the global economy after two full years. Okay, so, so, get this, what if, what if, we assume the computer share has an algorithm that manages their operational efficiency, and this algorithm works like a heat lamp in a diner. 
The algorithm moves shares into the DTCC in anticipation of imminent transactions. So what Wall Street is doing is rolling up a bus full of people into the parking lot. The staff start making hamburgers and putting them under the heat lamp. But wouldn't you know, the customers are all vegetarian and I guess aren't hungry. So now the DTCC can borrow the hamburgers and use them to create synthetic hamburgers, which can be used to cover Citadel's illegal hamburger sales and then return the counterfeit hamburgers to the diner as if they were the originals. The perfect crime. But this wasn't the part of heat lamp that made it stick. That hamburger metaphor was buried inside a 5,000 word rant, so incoherent that we can't even pull any usable sound bites. It's just walls of nonsense. The author's prior attempts at sharing this thesis had been met with criticism and mockery, resulting in mods putting the threads in the trash. So the core of Heat Lamp is this beautiful story of self-actualization, as the ape learned that his ideas are important and deserve to be read no matter what anyone tells him. The bulk of Heat Lamp is scathing accusations of censorship through intimidation by the mods, claiming that this banger of a DD is being suppressed by the mods to protect the interests of computer share and therefore the interests of the enemy. It's full-blown McCarthyism, and that rhetoric is what apes took from Heat Lamp. The ape influencers find themselves more and more in the same dilemma as conservative YouTubers who nurtured fascist audiences. They need to play to the crowd or risk being turned on. During the scripting of this video, Adabit, one of the key figures in the ape community who you've been seeing constantly, deleted his account in response to harassment brought on by expressing waving faith in the ability of apes to defeat Ken Griffin. Adabit, like so many DD authors before him, evolved into his final form. You slash deleted. The soap opera conspiracy twists and turns, that's the fun stuff. The really sinister element of all of this is that it's not just socially engaging, it's addictive. Ape forums are littered with statements and sentiments that are stereotypical of gambling addicts. Apes are constantly talking about their plans to buy more, how they wish they could afford more, how they can't wait for their paycheck so they can get more shares of Bed Bath & Beyond. They use contrarian sentiment to justify their habit. The price goes down, buy more. The price goes up, buy more. Bad news, buy more. Good news, buy more. Thanks for the tasty dip. They suppress the price, I buy more out of spite. They hide their habit from friends and family, complain that partners try to limit how much GameStop they buy, and brag about going behind their partners' backs. They take money from friends and family while talking up the college degree worth of DD they found on Reddit, and pour it all into this slate of poorly run companies that they believe have been elected as the candidate for a mythological short squeeze. The entire idea of dollar cost averaging, an actual investment strategy, has been warped into pure delusional cope of averaging down, as the stock price keeps plummeting. In their minds it's a sure play, so of course it makes sense to lower your cost basis and thus improve your return, but even then, within the whole mythology of MOAS, if the stock is supposed to go to phone book numbers, then it really doesn't matter what your average was. It's just an exercise in sunk costs, catching a falling knife. As for me, after holding from $350 to $40, price drops only get me more excited. Every price drop is a discount and another opportunity to buy. The performative aspects are irony poisoned and insincere in a genuinely sickening way. A lot of the ape lore is easily discarded by their podcasters and DD authors because they ultimately know it's not true. The hype, the tinfoil, the coincidences, the wife changing money, the Lambos, these are all the social performances needed to maintain the veneer wrapped around the pathetic core of a gambling addiction whose only hope for recovery is recruitment. It's the justification and distancing, the things that need to be true in order for the vast amounts of time, energy, and money dumped into these shares to not be a waste. But apes will still always keep one foot grounded, where they can say, oh, of course Teddy Day wasn't going to happen, that was just hype. For fun. The thing that January 2021 demonstrated was that the price can go to the moon for no coherent, sensible, sane reason beyond a bunch of people on a forum willing it into existence by convincing enough other people to believe. 
And if it happened once, then maybe it can happen again. But that constant doublethink, the constant cognitive dissonance of hyping up knowingly fake ideas purely to maintain energy in a failing stock play, to put on an outward-facing performance, to lure in new participants, because if you don't, if you flinch, if the irony armor cracks and you admit out loud that you don't actually believe, then it all falls apart, reality becomes true, and then it definitely won't happen again. That takes a toll. The illusion must be defended at all costs, because the illusion is all there is. On April 23rd, 2023, Bed Bath & Beyond filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Despite the staggering dilution deal, the company simply couldn't raise enough capital to get ahead of its debts, most of which were incurred in a stock buyback program that only ended in late 2022, long after the start of the company's decline. Over the course of May and June, they sold off the company piecemeal. Favorable lease obligations here, a building there, inventory, shelves, desk, chairs, computers, basically anything a price could be attached to was sold off and the proceeds sent directly to their creditors. Apes, of course, willfully immune to reality at this point, considered all of this to be bullish. This would be painful but necessary, but when all was said and done, even if Moas never happened, Bed Bath would still pay off handsomely. This was founded on absolutely nothing, rooted entirely in word games based on theories that the company failed to directly deny. The company itself had been warning them since January that in the event of bankruptcy, holders of the common shares would likely receive no recovery. Critics who predicted that the Hudson deal would merely upgrade the company's forced liquidation in Chapter 7 up to a managed liquidation in Chapter 11 were right, and apes were wrong. Literally, nothing that apes predicted came true because they aligned themselves into a movement that refused categorically to accept reality as it exists. Trading prices for our securities may bear little or no relationship to the actual recovery, if any, by holders of our securities. Bankruptcy proceedings plotted along, and the mythological Ryan Cohen reverse triangle merger Teddy Icon partnership NFT dividend reward for loyal shareholders never emerged. In early June, the deadline for the stocking horse bid kept getting kicked back a few days at a time, from the 1st to the 8th to the 11th to the 13th. Since the stocking horse bid sets the tempo for further liquidations, rumors in reality were that the bids submitted were all relatively small grabs at specific assets, rather than any move for the company itself, and the company wanted more time behind the scenes to try and rustle up a better offer. Rumors in the Ape universe were that the offers were in fact so good that Bed Bath needed more time to properly evaluate the true value of complicated share-for-share -share offerings of GameStop and Icon Enterprises LP for BBBY. Again, Icon's sole involvement in all of this is that he let Ryan Cohen take a photo with him. The actual stocking horse bid selected on June 13th was Overstock, a $900 million company offering $21.5 million for the company's name, logo, website, mobile app, and relevant databases. Chalk another W up for the Wall Street Journal and their sources familiar with the matter. Finally, September 29th, 2023, the company formerly known as Bed Bath & Beyond canceled, released, and extinguished all shares in the company. Those intangible legal rights, the actual thing shares represent, ceased to exist. And you might hope that that would be the end of all of this, but, well, you know it isn't. See, there's always something to grasp onto. The shares may be legally void, but it'll take years for every last broker on earth to remove the worthless husks from apes' accounts because of boring reasons like record-keeping laws and just low priority. 
So that's years and years where an ever-dwindling core of increasingly entrenched Bed Bath apes can hold out hope that Ryan Cohen will swoop in and gift them absurdly valuable shares in a company that doesn't even exist. The apocalypse is always just one more day away. Apes are, in a lot of ways, the funhouse mirror version of the stock market. They're not anti-Wall Street, they're Sundare for Wall Street. They want to be scrappy, important, savvy, underdog traders who saw an opportunity and seized it. They quote the Wolf of Wall Street in the big short because that's who they see themselves as. Sure, they say they hate Wall Street, but then they spend all their free time obsessing over funneling more and more of their money into the stock market. There's a desire, an instinct, to try and tease apes apart from the rest of the stock market, to invalidate their approach as a perversion of the market, if not something entirely separate. It can be said that the apes aren't engaging with stocks as an intangible signifier of a claim to some percent of a company, but as a wholly distinct thing, an entirely abstract vessel of value. Given the overlap between crypto apes and meme stock apes, whether it's GameStop or Dogecoin, it's really the same behavior. An accurate criticism of the ape system is that this behavior entirely decouples the price of the shares from the value of the company, to the point that companies like Bed Bath & Beyond are saying as much in their filings. The ape counter-criticism is that this is just how the stock market works, that they're just doing what the big players do. And this is a compelling conflict of ideas, because it's wrong, but not entirely wrong. There is an argument to be made that in one sense, all stocks are meme stocks, that narrative and story are the driving forces of the stock market, that talk of fundamentals is all lip service, that fundamentals only matter insofar as they can be woven into the story. After all, the whole exercise is a game of trying to predict the future, trying to price in things that haven't happened but you believe are going to. And that is, really, just complicated storytelling. Both groups are telling a story and just sort of lightly gesturing at something external to the narrative that justifies its conclusions. In that regard, apes are, in fact, a reflection of the system. Really, the only major difference is that the things they are gesturing towards are not merely wishful thinking based on suggestive data, but entirely confabulated nonsense. Nothing in ape psychology is new. Addiction to gambling, the pressure of social control, we are all vulnerable to these in some degree, but when you get deep into these places, it takes on whole new forms. Apes are, as a result of their conflict with reality, particularly vulnerable to being further targeted by confidence men and other grifters. Some of them grift the apes for low-stake fame and prestige, some to wash their pet theories and gain support for their political policies, and some for plain old hard cash. It can be difficult to have empathy for apes because, frankly, a lot of them suck. They are conspiratorially minded and thus prone to all sorts of terrible beliefs, many of which dovetail into express anti-Semitism, making them ripe for recruitment into even more extreme ideologies. As addicts, they regularly make terrible decisions that hurt others. They talk often about stealing from their spouses or at least hiding their addictions as they spend all the money in the shared account. Many are profoundly unhappy in their relationships, joking through gritted teeth about wife changing money and how much they resent their partners. Of course, it's easy to see how that mutual resentment might form. They lie, they steal, they recruit relentlessly, and they insist that others simply fail to recognize their brilliance. They stress every relationship they are involved in and routinely hurt their families with their reckless gambling. It's no mystery why the wife isn't too happy with them these days. These groups and movements appeal to entitled personalities, and the entire structure of their psychology and socialization is addictive and retentive. The narrative of participation flatters them. It makes them savvy, important, forward-thinking investors who are beating the system at its own game. They cannot leave, quit, or even mentally check out, because then they'll miss the window of the next big play. When the due diligence and quantitative theory are made up out of mythological nothingness, it's easy, even logical, for the upsides to be so overwhelmingly valuable that any behavior, no matter how craven or irrational, becomes permissible. It's tempting to see apes in their full performative hubris bragging about buying the dip and thanking Ken for the discount and think, you know what, they brought this on themselves. 
But no one deserves to be exploited like this. No one deserves to get shaken down by grifters to the point that they have no other choice but to become grifters themselves and shake down everyone else around them. No one deserves to have their ego and security ground down to the point that there's no escape, no reason to step back and admit defeat, no reason to reflect. Ironically, the biggest winners in all of this have been hedge funds. Sure, Keith and a few others made bank off the GameStop run, but half of them gambled their gains away. Hedge funds, on the other hand, have been able to play against apes and their predictable irrationality. Melvin ate dirt in 21 and closed up shop in 22, but Citadel started using Wall Street bets as a recruiting ground, and Hudson Bay made a tidy profit by assuming that apes wouldn't just buy and hold through massive dilution, but would outright thank them for the tasty dip. It is, as a phenomenon, an incredibly fraught subject for regulators because, just, how do you respond to this? Setting aside bigger, broader questions about what markets even should be, how do you respond in the immediate term to a group of investors with enough collective inertia to move prices, but a fundamentally flawed understanding of what they're even doing? The grim irony of ape culture is that it has the operative mechanisms of a gambling addiction without actually gambling. See, if it were a gamble, if they were truly betting on something, then there would be some actual odds of winning. Apes like to talk about high risk and high reward as a coping mechanism as the mismanaged companies they're betting on continue to slide out of business, but all framing devices like that assume that the thing you're betting on can actually happen. But the weakest team in the league can, theoretically, pull out a dark horse run and take the cup. That's a high risk, high reward bet. Apes, on the other hand, with their theories of MOAS, with their coincidences and Icon secret reverse triangle mergers, with their fundamental misunderstanding of how a short sale even works, they're sitting around a blackjack table, convincing each other that there's a secret rule. That if you hit 31, then the dealer has to give you their entire tray. So hit me. Hit me. Hit me. Hit me. For the record, I have read the entire United States Bankruptcy Code written by the 95th American Congress, November 6, 1978. It has given me an incredible understanding of how to factually interpret information filed on Kroll, given understanding to previously omitted information that I disregarded in the past. And I will be referencing United States law to factually prove that Ryan Cohen remains involved with this company. Plus, we clearly have figured out the game these people are playing and have their balls in a vice. If it's not this play, we move on to the next. The honey hole has been exposed. It feels like we're driving backwards really fast at a wall, and just before we hit it, the secret level in Ready Player One is gonna open up and let us pass by the entire race and win. The fact that so many shills spend so much of their time endlessly replying to us yelling at us to explain what assets are left, how we're soon gonna go to zero. I've never seen so many humans spend so much of their time on something that doesn't concern them, and it's quite bullish. The short hedge fund's biggest mistake, in my opinion, is they tried to burn this company to the ground, which they succeeded, but that's been a known move all along by an activist investor. Know your enemy. Now they are trapped in bankruptcy court, so now apes can buy really low, and the upside is so high. If you like this prediction, I also have a free NFT giveaway. 